We will make a start. You're all very welcome to today's Governance and Strategic Planning Committee. I'm going to hand over to the Chief Executive just to take the role. John. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members, both physically and online. Uh, to all members of Governance and Strategic Planning Committee, you're hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of the committee, um, which will be a hybrid meeting to be conducted remotely via WebEx and physically here in the Council Chamber in the Guildhall today, Tuesday, the 17th of May at 4 o'clock. Alderman Breslin. Here, John. Alderman Devaney. Here, John. Alderman McClintock. Here, John. Alderman McCready. Here. Councillor John Boyle. Aye. Councillor Donnelly. Not shot. Councillor Doyle. Here, John. Councillor Duffy. Shot. Councillor Farrell. Here. Councillor Fleming. Councillor Heaney. Shot. Councillor McHugh. Councillor Mooney. Here. And Councillor Riley. Here. Thank you, members. Yeah. Thanks for that, John. Um, members, next item is the statement for remote meetings. Uh, I would like to remind everyone who is in remote attendance or here in the chamber that this meeting is will be broadcast live via the Council's YouTube channel and will be available for viewing by the public and media. The broadcast will also be available for repeated viewing at a later date. This broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with Council protocol. Members and approved speakers are reminded to only have their mics and cameras on while speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight a request to speak. By participating in this meeting, you are consenting to being filmed and to the use and storage of those images for broadcasting on trading purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. A copy of the Council Privacy Notice may be found on the Council website www.derrystaban.com. Okay, members. So moving on to the agenda item four, which is declarations of members' interests. Anyone with an interest to declare, either do so now in the chat box or verbalise it here in the chamber. I don't see anyone coming in on item four, which is fine, which is to move on then to uh, item five, which is the deputation. We have two deputations uh, members this afternoon. So the first one is to receive Orla McStravick, Head of Infrastructure and Racial Equality Division, and Miss Debbie Murphy, Racial Equality Unit from the Northern Ireland uh, Executive Office to brief members on supporting re refugees and asylum seekers. So I'm going to hand over to our guests and welcome them to the virtual chamber. Uh, and if you want to begin your presentation, then after you have concluded, then I'll open it up to the floor for members to ask questions. So handing over to Orla or Debbie. Good afternoon um, and thank you very much for having us here to speak to you today. We are going to start off just by giving a bit of background around um, some of the work on refugees and asylum seekers being taken forward by the executive departments um, and as part of that we'll give a bit of um, broader background to the routes by which people will come through to become refugees or asylum seekers here. If you could move on to the next slide, please. So this first slide sets out what the definition of a refugee is according to the UN Refugee Convention of 1951. Defines a refugee as a person who is outside his or her country of nationality or habitual residence, has a well-founded fear of persecution because of his or her race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion, and is unable or unwilling to avail himself or herself of the protection of that country or to return there for fear of persecution. Um, we sometimes hear the terms, if you move on to the next slide, sorry, we sometimes hear the terms refugee and asylum seeker used interchangeably, um, but the asylum application process and immigration status do differentiate between the two terms. Um, so just a caveat, this slide is a very basic description of the two and there are several nuances in terms of different immigration statuses, which I'll not go into, but this is a high level overview. So an asylum seeker flees their homeland, arrives in another country, whichever way they can, makes themselves known to the authorities, submits an asylum application 
and has a legal right to stay in the country while they're awaiting a decision. Um, just to note that the this is a broad description of the journey to status. In reality, the asylum, asylum application process is very complex and can be extremely lengthy. So that sums it up in five points. However, you know, it can take years to achieve refugee status. A refugee then, in terms of someone who has refugee status, has proven to the authorities that they would be at risk if returned to their home country, has had their claim for asylum accepted by the government and can now stay here either long term or indefinitely. Um, while there are several differences between refugees and asylum seekers, one of the points to note is that asylum seekers are not allowed to work whereas refugees have the right to work and to access mainstream benefits. Asylum seekers can only access the designated asylum seeker support um, and can't access things like universal credit. They will have access to health care and education, but not to the mainstream benefits system. So this next slide routes to arrival sets out how some of the people who are here will have arrived. Now there's again some nuances within these, but these are broadly the main routes by which people would find themselves here. The first one is arriving independently to seek asylum. This is by far the largest cohort of people who are here um, and most people will arrive in this way. The second one is as victims of trafficking, which is people who are brought here against their will or who are brought under false pretenses, they will also end up um, in the asylum system to seek asylum. And then the third one is resettlement schemes, which some of you will be familiar with. Um, there were uh, 1,815 individuals welcomed here under the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme over the course of five years. The people who arrive under resettlement schemes come with their status already. They don't go through an asylum application process here. That's already been done when they come through on these schemes. Um, the next one is family reunification. And family reunification, um, there are specific circumstances in which an individual who has attained refugee status, they're eligible for to apply for their children or dependents to join them. And that can be both people who have gone through the asylum application process here and got their status in that way. And also people who've come through resettlement can apply for family members to join them. The next one is humanitarian visa routes, which people will be very familiar with now because of the Ukrainian scheme. And the last point there is the national transfer scheme for unaccompanied asylum seeking children. Unaccompanied asylum seeking children can also arrive through a variety of the above routes. Um, but there is a scheme called the National Transfer Scheme, which is where um, minors who are unaccompanied minors who arrive into the UK are dispersed through different local authorities. And that's done on a rotational basis. And Northern Ireland has committed to taking a small number of um, unaccompanied children that way. But again, by far the vast majority of unaccompanied minors coming through here are doing so independently. If you move on to the next slide, please. So Home Office will provide in their presentation and Mayor's um, information on the current picture in terms of the numbers. Um, but it's important to note that globally, the numbers of displaced people has increased significantly over the last five years and that these increases are being reflected in our own arrivals figures. So in order to support the work that is uh, ongoing to support the people who are arriving here, a number of structures have been set up. Now that is in response to some changes over the last few years to the circumstances here in relation to um, the asylum framework. And just to give a little bit of background to that, um, previously Northern Ireland was um, a joint contracting area with Scotland and in 2019 became an independent contracting area under the Asylum Accommodation and Support Contract. That has meant that a number of structures have been set up since then to facilitate um, supporting work and providing information and advice on the contract and engaging more closely with Home Office on this. The first structure mentioned on that slide is the Strategic Planning Group, which was initially set up to deliver the Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme. And it includes um, 
all of the or a wide range of government departments and their agencies and it was set up to ensure an overarching strategic direction for the operation of the resettlement scheme. In 2020, it was proposed that the remit of that group would be expanded to cover all asylum seekers and refugees, because at that stage, uh, we were an independent or an independent region in terms of the contracting for the AASC and also the numbers had started to increase. So we could see that there was a real need to expand the remit of that group. Um, an innovation lab was held in March 2020 to look at how best to support the integration of refugees and asylum seekers and amongst the findings for that was the need for improved strategic level working across the board on asylum seekers and refugees um, irrespective of what route they arrived by and it was recognised that there was a growing need to provide an effective forum to escalate and consider the wider issues and at that point that was why the expansion of the remit of the planning group was agreed by ministers. The next group on that list is the regional delivery group and that is um, set up and managed by the Strategic Migration Partnership and the Home Office and it uh, deals predominantly with issues relating to the contract. The Executive Office, the Housing Executive and representatives from um, some of the health trusts sit on that as well. Uh, and it is envisaged that as the dispersal of accommodation into other council areas continues, that there will be broader representation on that group to include um, more regional representation as well. The Refugee and Asylum Forum is um, an or a forum which has been set up in the community sector and it is made up of organisations that uh, deal with the direct provision of resources and support to refugees and asylum seekers. And it's very much um, a forum for developing and sharing practical solutions to the sorts of issues and requirements which refugees and asylum seekers have. And um, we engage with that forum in terms of feeding into the broader work. And it was also that strand of work um, particularly influential in the development of the refugee integration strategy. The last on that set of structures is the racial equality subgroup which was set up under the racial equality strategy and um, is intended to be the voice of minority ethnic communities at the heart of government they advise on a wide range of topics and one of the working groups which they've recently set up is on refugees and asylum seekers but um, there is representation from a broad range of community sector groups on the subgroup and they would provide strategic level input Could you move on to the next slide, please? The Refugee Integration Strategy went out to consultation in November 2021 and closed on the 21st of February 2022. It was a commitment under the Racial Equality Strategy and um, was developed following the Innovation Lab. Um, was uh, Sorry, my sound's going a little bit here. Um, Thanks. Um, I think it's Alderman Breslin. Could you just make sure you're on mute, please? Thanks. Oh, sorry. I thought it was feedback from my microphone. That's okay. Um, the refugee integration strategy was commitment under the racial equality strategy, and it is intended to provide strategic direction for government departments, their agencies, and a broad kind of whole of government approach to supporting refugees and asylum seekers to integrate fully. And that means work both with um, host communities and um, refugees and asylum seekers to support integration. There are a number of um, strands to that strategy and we had um, a really good response rate to it. In addition to the um, responses received to the um, consultation, we contracted Red Cross to deliver a series of workshops with refugees and asylum seekers directly to inform the consultation. We've now received the final report for that piece of work um, and the Education Authority. They also took forward a small number of workshops with schools with the highest proportion of newcomer pupils. The next steps for the refugee integration strategy are that the revision um, the revisions to the integration strategy following the consultation are ongoing 
and obviously with what's happening with the Ukrainian crisis and the response to that, we want to make sure that we take into account um, some of the approaches there and some of the learning from that, particularly because um, looking at things like the Nationality and Borders Bill, it does seem like these sorts of schemes are likely to be the future um, sort of approach of the government in terms of uh, supporting those who are seeking asylum or refugee status that they would the you know the approach is to um encourage people to come under formal routes such as resettlement or humanitarian visa schemes uh, so we want to make sure that the strategy is flexible enough to be able to respond to um, any future schemes thank you so the next slide refers to partnership working, which is really um, how we came initially to approach the council was around the engagement with councils and um, voluntary and community sector organisations. So in terms of supporting integration, uh, both under the refugee integration strategy and the development of that, but also in terms of the ongoing day to day work, which has been happening on the asylum contract, you'll be aware that um, the accommodation for asylum seekers has predominantly been in Belfast over the past, um, well, <laughs> in up until now. Um, and with the increase in arrivals, it has become clear that it was not any going to be possible any longer to accommodate um, all of the asylum seekers within the Belfast boundaries. And so a piece of work began to identify where it would be possible to expand out and to look at um, other areas for securing what is referred to as dispersed accommodation. Um, prior to 2019-2020, initial accommodation and dispersed accommodation were really a change in status here and it was quite often have been the asylum seeker would have been placed in an address and that may have been their initial accommodation and then become their dispersed accommodation. That's quite different now. Um, with the numbers that we see now, we have uh, uh, quite a number of hotel um, hotel style accommodation um, being used for the IA, which is the initial accommodation. So what we're talking about with local councils is really the housing, which is the longer term um, accommodation. And we are coming to local councils and voluntary and community sector organisations to try and develop a sustainable approach to this. Um, the way that this exercise has been informed is obviously it has to start with where there is accommodation available and so Mears will talk um, about how that's identified. The role of the departments in that is to look at when the when Mears and the Home Office give us an idea of where they can identify that properties might be available, the departments will look at the resourcing um, in relation to their policy areas, uh, such as the Department of Health and the Education Authority, for example, if there's an area which has primary school places, but not uh, post primary places, they might advise that, you know, families with younger children are placed there, or there are areas which are more suitable for um, adults without children if there's a particular pinch point on education. Um, following on from that, then we would approach the local council and look at um, developing an orientation pack for anyone to be housed in the area and to look at a local, what's referred to as a heat mapping exercise, but is basically to look at the availability of resource on the ground, community resources, access to English language classes, voluntary and community activities, and um, the sorts of things that support integration. We recognise that councils in the voluntary sector are really key to getting that aspect right. Um, they have the local knowledge, they know who is on the ground filling, the, filling those roles and um, they have, you know, good practice from working with other groups or um, in, you know, p potentially linked but different areas. Um, 
some will have experience through the resettlement schemes and um, there will be lots of different roles that councils undertake which they will find they can develop a similar approach um, for supporting asylum seekers and refugees. We are looking at running a good practice sharing event uh, hopefully before the summer um, and that is intended to be with a small number of representatives um, from council officials and also voluntary sector organisations represented in the 11 council areas to be intended to share good practice with the councils who have experience, um, longer term experience in supporting asylum seekers in their council areas who have maybe developed a model in response to some of the more recent hotel accommodation scenarios and also to look at lessons learned through that. Um, but that is intended really to be an initial event and part of a longer term plan of engagement with councils and voluntary sector. Um, the individual council groups are being established as and when um, accommodation is identified in those council areas. That is to make sure that we work with those councils that are to be affected eminently uh, individually, but that there is a longer term engagement plan with all councils so that we can also um, try and get ahead of the work in other areas. Could you move on to the next slide, please? So um, part of this I'm going to pass on to Orla, but the unified approach really refers to both what I've talked about in terms of um, the linking with the voluntary sector and the local councils and the departments and agencies and all of the different aspects of the work linking together to develop a coordinated approach to supporting asylum seekers and refugees to ensure that we have representatives from the appropriate health trust engaged, the local education authority people, the PSNI and different agencies but it also goes further to link up the approach to resettlement, the Ukrainian scheme and supporting asylum seekers. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Orla there because Orla has a broader overview of all of those schemes. Yeah, thanks Debbie and, and I'll be brief because I'm, I'm conscious of time, but yeah, th this is really just to flag um, in terms of our refugee integration strategy, we want to make sure that we're looking at um, asylum seekers and refugees, regardless of, of whether, what resettlement scheme or what route that they come under, that we in the future have a more streamlined approach that will be flexible and agile enough to lend itself to whatever is happening now and whatever happens in the future. So in terms of the Ukrainian um, scheme, obviously that was very different than the Syrian scheme and our approach to that has had to be very different. But there is a lot of things within that that actually can be adaptable to anybody, regardless of what route they come under. So as part of our work on the refugee integration strategy, we're trying to learn from that in terms of that local support and that wraparound um, support and provision, we want it to be something that will um, lend its support to support refugees under any scheme or regardless of the route that they arrive. So in terms of our future, that will be something that we are taking forward now as part and parcel of our work on finalising the refugee integration strategy and looking towards the implementation of that. Just to, to do it, all the resettlement schemes are different. They're approached differently and their policy isn't devolved on that to the NI executive. So the schemes are set up by the Home Office. But the local response is something that we do have the control over. And we want to make sure that that is flexible enough and adaptable enough that it will lend itself to, to everybody that's here now and, and indeed in the future, regardless of their route. Debbie, I think that's probably the end of the presentation. And we're just happy to take any sort of comments or questions. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah and Dora, for talking through that and also uh, for giving us uh, advance sight of the presentation this afternoon. It helps members digest it and read through it in advance of today. So appreciate that. Um, happy enough to open it up to the floor. I, I do note in the chat box uh, that Councillor McHugh has joined the meeting. So thank you uh, for that, Rory, if his attendance can be added. Uh, so happy enough to open it up to the floor. Uh, I see uh, in the Jab box, uh, Councillor McGowan, and then Councillor Heaney, and then Councillor Sinai Barr. So go ahead, John. Can I just say thanks very much? That's a very uh, comprehensive uh, set of presentations. Uh, we were involved, uh, an organization I work with, we're involved with the Syrians a bit, and uh, we're working now with the Ukrainians. Very different schemes. Um, I agree that a refugee and uh, an asylum seeker. I see them as exactly the same, and uh, 
they, 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 they need our help, they need our support. And, you know, as a party, I think we've got to be seen really much like a sanctuary city. So anything we can do uh, to help these individuals, um, you know, improve their, their quality of life when they're here. I do know that, I feel, uh, you know, it's a very different scheme for the asylum seekers. I know that uh, it's a lot of younger young men, and I think it's very important that we, we try and do, if we can, as much as possible. Um, I know, for example, they, they, they're not allowed to work, they're not allowed to get employment. Uh, are they allowed to do training? Are they allowed to uh, get involved in, in, in tourism type stuff? Or, well, I don't mean work, I mean, are they allowed to do, I know they're allowed to do language training. But it's a long day when you're not able to work and you're a young man. It's not great for your mental health, it's not great for your, your general well-being. So I think, uh, you know, whatever we do in there, we, we, you know, if we can get some best practice, get talking to our people, but let's ensure we do as much as we can. I think uh, these mainly young men, we've got to do as much as we can to, to help them and ensure that their time here is well spent. So thanks very much. I've, I've learned a lot from that today. Uh, and we, we've got to extend as warm a welcome as possible for, for these people from wherever they're from. Uh, they're, they're coming here for sanctuary, they're coming here for help, so let's do all we can to help them. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, John. Uh, I'm conscious we do have a second deputation as well, so uh, I don't want to forget about that either, but it's, uh, so it's useful just to at this stage pause and take questions maybe for Deborah and for Orla. And then we move to Ray's uh, presentation as well. So I'm um, happy to take the next indicator speaker, which is Con Councillor Heaney Connor. Uh, thanks, Chair. It's along the same veins uh, as as Councillor McGowan just uh, articulated there now. Like, uh, thanks very much, obviously, first of all, for the presentation. Uh, it was very informative. Uh, I had a, some experience of this when I was in the executive office in, in the sort of the establishment of the Syrian scheme uh, locally here. Um, but as you rightly pointed out, that was a number of years ago and there's been changes of contracts. So I, I think Gordon, in fairness, answered this question, but just to, to repeat it in terms of the policies in relation to this, uh, how much scope does the executive office have um, to improve or to change or to develop policies around this? Or, or, or are we all constrained by the British Home Office in terms of the policy, because uh, you mentioned earlier about who could work, who couldn't work, who can access benefits, who can't access benefits. So uh, it will be useful to know if there is any scope uh, to improve uh, our service and, and, and to help the people that are coming here. So thanks for that. Okay, thanks, Connor. Um, next speaker is Councillor C. Now Bar. Lillian, go ahead. Thanks, Chair, for letting me in. Uh, I am not a member of this committee, but I just wanted to record my thanks to Ola and Debbie for the presentation, and in particular for outlining the existing supporting structures for people seeking protection here in Northern Ireland. Um, you have made a very complex issue easy to understand, and I just wanted to commend you for providing a, a very clear description of the different immigration status and the lengthy process uh, of people seeking asylum here. And uh, you've also provided a breakdown of the structures and these are very strategic groups that informs policy. It is also good to hear that workshops were contacted to inform the consultation. The racial equality subgroup has a good representation of minority ethnic people. And I think there are three of us who have come through the asylum process and uh, you know that I'm a member of the subgroup. I note that there is a refugee and asylum forum and it would be helpful to hear more about the makeup of that forum and its impact because it is critical to have lived experience at decision-making levels when developing a strategy to integrate refugees and asylum seekers. And I wonder if you can provide us also with a timeline when when we should be expecting you to complete the drafting of the refugee integration strategy. I understand we may not have an executive, but that is not a reason not to complete the process. And while I acknowledge that these are a lot have changed, uh, this process 
began in 2016 and we are the only part of the UK without an existing refugee integration strategy and maybe some of the issues that we are facing right now we may not be facing if we had a strategy in place. I also want to comment on the Nationality and Borders Bill which came into law on the 28th of April and I noted that you haven't mentioned it. The Nationality and Borders Bill is the most draconian immigration statutes ever enacted in the UK. Among its many provisions is the creation of a two-tier system of asylum, meaning those who arrive in the UK via the so-called irregular means will receive less protection and support and will be subject to detention. We know that people seeking protection here have no recourse to public funds and you have highlighted that. The only exception being those from Ukraine. No other conflict zone are included in this exclusion. And of immediate concern to me, particularly for asylum seekers here in Derry, those who arrived last month is the new rule that those whose claim are indismissible, that means they used unauthorized routes to get here or stopped in other country during their journey can be falsely removed to a safe third country. And in this case, it's Rwanda we are talking about, which recently concluded a deal with the UK. I am aware of some of the asylum seekers in Belfast who have already been informed that their removal is imminent. I don't know if you're aware of that. And before I came to this meeting today, I met 30 asylum seekers from Eritrea who are currently staying in a hotel here in Derry. Most of them arrived last month and have begun to make connection and finally feel that they have found refuge. And since December 2021, unaccompanied minors seeking asylum have been arriving in Derry. Many are teenagers from Somalia. I had the pleasure of meeting them and even housing some. Their stories are heartbreaking. What they have seen or experienced is beyond belief. And after taking such a difficult journey to get here, they could be forcefully put on a plane to a country 4,000 miles away. And quite apart from it being illegal under the international law, the scrutiny and fear of being sent away adds to the trauma and anxiety to an already traumatized group of people and while children under 18 have better access to health, health, medical support, and even some counseling, adults, asylum seekers are left to vent for themselves. Most cannot is speak English and are expected to telephone GPs and arrange appointments, despite not even knowing how the system works or even speaking the language. And the Nationality and Borders Bill which we now know it is cruel and inhumane, a fact recognized by the, the Scottish and Welsh government who have refused to comply with the act. And both the Scottish and Welsh police have indicated that they will not participate in the forced removal of these traumatized people. I wonder why our executive office isn't making a recommendation that Northern Ireland should also not comply with this uh, immigration laws. So in light of the potential forced removal of some of the 46, 43 asylum seekers living here in Derry, I would ask a colleague who is a member of the committee to formally propose that this council write to the executive office, asking them to join their colleagues in the Scottish and Welsh government and refuse to comply with those provisions of the Nationality and Borders Act 2022 which mandate the authorities to forcibly remove asylum seekers to Rwanda. And the second ask is to write to the Minister for Health, asking him to immediately put in place procedures to ensure that all asylum seekers have access to proper and comprehensive medical assessment when they first arrive here and continuing care for the duration of their stay in Northern Ireland with adequate translation services and support. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Councillor Barr. I'm unconscious, as you said yourself at the start, you're not a member of the committee, so if you're looking to make a proposal, um, then it'll need to come from somebody who is a member of the committee. I see Councillor Mooney has his hand up. Go ahead, Sean. Uh, 
Thank you, Chair, and uh, happy to endorse the proposal made by my colleague, Councillor Sinai Barr. Thank okay, you, Chair. Thanks for that. Uh, Mr. Farley, you happy to second? Okay. Members, uh, there are some other indicated speakers. Uh, thank you, Lillian, for putting that into the chat box so people can see it. Uh, but before we take it as a proposal for people to consider um, and move to the next indicated speaker, uh, and if the committee clerk can have the text, the proposal brought up onto the screen for people to, to see that's there in the chamber. Um, the next indicated speaker um, was Alderman McCready, but he's indicated he's happy to wait until the second deputation. Uh, Councillor Donnelly, are you happy to speak now, or do you want to wait for the second deputation as well? I, I'm, I'm happy to speak, Mr Chair, if that's okay. okay. Yep, go ahead, Gary. Well, uh, Orlan and Debbie, thanks for the, the presentation, very comprehensive. But I do believe that, you know, officials and people at the top, you know, what they say and what happens on the ground are two very different uh, scenarios. My, uh, you know, experiences in dealing with uh, some of the Syrian uh, people who have resettled here under the Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme is that they've been treated, they've basically been abandoned. And, you know, whether it's even basic health services like, you know, being registered as blind. But over the last two days, I've been dealing extensively with the Syrian family who found themselves uh, homeless. They said that they had contact with someone like a key worker at the beginning, which was four or five years ago. And from that, for that after that two months, they've basically been abandoned and had no contact by anyone. They've approached me within the last uh, fortnight. And when I contacted the housing executive, I was told that I had to deal with somebody in Belfast because they were under the Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme. And a number of emails later, there was no response from the the the, the worker who was uh, tasked to look after them. And he came back and said, you know, this isn't our address. Uh, so effectively, he couldn't find them on the system. And what had happened was that they had been offered temporary accommodation after coming to the city. And both offers of temporary accommodation, they weren't in the city. One was in Limavati. So they sourced their own accommodation and they recently got a notice to quit and they didn't know who to turn to they didn't know where 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 to go so i think that you know that that on the ground that there's very serious problems very serious gaps and you know I, I can't understand how someone from the belfast office can deal more efficiently with with people on the ground here in in, in the city and you know it's caused them an awful lot of uh, anxiety. So there is, in my opinion, a lot of gaps and a lot of people falling through the cracks. And I think that's something that needs to be taken on board because at the end of the day, these people are vulnerable. And I think that some of them are being let down. I think there needs the you know, the people with responsibility here needs to look into this. You know, I couldn't even get their file transferred from Belfast to the city here and you know, and, and the level of service from the individual and, and the housing executive in Belfast leaves a lot to be uh, desired. So they are effectively homeless at the minute. The housing executive have eventually said that they would uh, put their stuff in the storage and then they offered them temporary accommodation again, this time in Enniskillen. And to me, that's completely unacceptable. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Donnelly. Um, I'm going to invite back in now. There's no other indicated speakers at this stage. So, uh, Deborah or Orla, if there's any uh, responses that you have to some of the questions that have been raised or the points raised, now's your opportunity to address them if you wish, please. Yeah, I think just to say, first of all, you know, it's helpful and, and some of those local stories that we wouldn't be aware of, obviously, TEO chair the strategic planning group. So, if there is specific issues with specific families you know we're we're happy to take them on board and, and raise them as well with the relevant people through the strategic planning group if that's helpful and um, we did sort of say at the start in terms of the division of responsibilities and i know lillian has touched on this in that the you know the home office have the policy responsibility for the the asylum and the, the refugee routes so we can't actually take decisions on the route themselves or the actual policy position 
but we do and we can continue to flag from the Northern Ireland context and any concerns that we have or issues that we have. Now, obviously, at the minute, we don't have ministers, so we can't do that at a ministerial level. Um, but, you know, it, it's certainly something that we do at, at an official level. And we our focus is trying to maximise the support that we can provide locally through the final refugee integration strategy and building on the work that's already there, recognising, you know, as people have said, there, there are some gaps between what happens with an asylum seeker and what happens with, with the refugees. And that's something that we want to address through the refugee integration strategy and through that comprehensive support that is flexible and agile enough to, to lend itself to, to all who are here. So helpful comments, and we'll certainly take them on, on board in terms of the future work and feed them back in through the strategic planning group as well. Okay, thank you very much, Orla. Um, folks, I don't have any other indicator speakers. I, I do have a proposal on the screen. Is there are members uh, content to accept that proposal and pass it? I'll give it a few moments in the room here and also on the chat box to see if there's any opposition. And I'm not seeing anyone indicating uh, opposition to it, so I uh, will take those um, that proposal from Councillor Mooney and seconded by Councillor Farrell as passed and move then to the second deputation, uh, which is to receive a uh, Apologies, members, on the agenda, the gentleman's name is Ryan, but it's actually Ray. So it's to receive Ray uh, Bundle from the uh, from Mayor's uh, Partnership Director, Diane Ward, and Ryan McMahon, uh, the DA Head of Operations, uh, to talk about asylum accommodation in the council area. So I'm going to hand over to Mayor's to take the second part of today's deputation. Go ahead. Well, hi all, um, and, and thank you very much for um, inviting us today. Um, I'm Ray Blundell. I'm a um, contract delivery director for Mears Group. I'll just explain the context of that title in a, in a few minutes. And I'm joined by um, Ryan McMahon, um, our head of operations, and Dane Ward, who's um, an acquisition officer within Mears. Um, I've only got literally five or six slides. Um, they are really just providing you with some background and context. Um, as to Mia's role in the asylum process. And I think um, hopefully they build, uh, I hope, um, very much on, on Deborah and all as um, a very, very um, helpful presentation. So could, could you just go to the first slide, please? So a little bit of background on the contract. Um, ASK stands for um, Asylum Accommodation and Support Contract. And uh, it was awarded to Mia's by the Home Office um, some two and a half years ago now. It's a 10 year contract, so um, about seven and a half years left on the contract. We were awarded three regions, um, North East Yorkshire and Humber, um, Scotland and, and Northern Ireland. And I think as, as Deborah um, set out, um, under the previous uh, contractual regime, Northern Ireland and Scotland was part of the same contract. I think very helpfully, uh, the Home Office separated it this time. So we have a, a specific um, Northern Ireland contract though, Coincidentally, we did win the Scotland contract um, as well. Um, we provide housing and support services to people seeking asylum. There is a, a distinction in our world between asylum seekers and refugees in that our role is to provide that accommodation and support to asylum seekers. But I'll, I'll, I'll describe um, in a little more detail what happens when um, asylum seekers get right to remain and become refugees a little bit um, later in the presentation. Um, the contract, um, which we refer to as ASK, um, kind of um, came into being to replace the previous COMPASS um, contract. A number of changes, I think, between COMPASS and ASK. One, I think the this contract places um, greater emphasis on the standards of, of homes, on the dispersal accommodation. It's all um, set up in a, in a suite of contractual uh, documentation, particularly um, a statement of requirements, which specifies um, standards that we we must um, we must get within our with our accommodation. And I think, um, and in line with I think Deborah and all as and a lot of the speakers, uh, the contributors' contributions so far, I think there's a, there's a bigger recognition I think on the vulnerability uh, of the people being housed uh, within uh, the system, um, and the support element of our contract very important to note that we don't just provide accommodation, we, pro we provide support. Very, very briefly, that support is around signposting um, to uh, services available uh, within 
health, within local government, within within communities. And we do that via um, a number of uh, housing managers and resident welfare managers. But once again, I'll touch very briefly on that uh, in, a in a few moments. So we go to the next slide. Um, I think we've, we've highlighted that, that there is, in some parts of the contract, there's a distinction between initial accommodation and dispersed accommodation. But in business as usual terms, in, in, uh, in Northern Ireland, that's usually the same thing. Um, it's usually provide, provided within um, private rental properties that uh, would have been available within the, the private uh, rental uh, market. Um, I alluded to the fact that the ASK contract has higher standards than the previous uh, contract. We inherited, I think, a, a, some stock from the previous contract. And based on our analysis of the type of stock that we've got previously, um, we handed back about 150 properties um, across Northern Ireland on the basis that they weren't meeting standards. Um, it's important to say that all properties uh, we propose to the scheme um, are evaluated and approved by the Strategic Migration Partnership. Um, ne next slide, please. So, yeah, this is probably the, the, the kind of um, most important thing in the context um, of today's presentation in that I think it's it's no secret that um, there's been significant pressure on the asylum system, um, in part caused, or, or, or in most part, I think, caused by the impact that, that COVID has had across um, the world and probably across across the UK. So across all of the um, providers' asylum contracts, there's been increased pressure on the system, and that's resulted in a, in a, in a big increase in the number of service users that have been housed in hotels. Um, so in common with um, Clear Springs in the south, Serco in the Midlands and the Northwest, who, who run the uh, asylum contracts there. Um, ourselves, as, as Mears, have been setting up um, hotels over the last um, two years, I suppose, uh, across our contracts in which to house um, service users. And the hotels are known as contingency accommodation. I think absolutely everybody, uh, and, and certainly ourselves, recognise that hotels are not uh, a particularly appropriate environment uh, to house um, our cohort, particularly for the, for the length of time that they're in the system. Um, so there has always been um, a, a move that providers should seek as, as quickly as possible um, to get um, service users out of those hotels and into um, more sustainable dispersal accommodation. And I think this move is now taking place in Northern Ireland. It's certainly taking place across the rest of the UK uh, in conjunction with Home Office and um, other uh, providers. However, I think it's worth saying that um, hotels will probably be with us for a little while yet. And whilst we're operational in hotels, um, we do uh, work with um, other partners, voluntary sector providers, and with our network of resident welfare managers uh, to provide as much sort of services and support as we can uh, to service users um, in hotels. And um, as part of that service, we arrange um, activities and we work with partners to, to signpost where additional support um, will be available. Um, next slide, please. So just wanted to very, very briefly build on, um, I think, um, the, the, um, the position set out by Deborah and all, just, just very quickly about the asylum process. And I'm not going to go through this in massive detail, but the, the way it works, and, and this is the, the, the scope of our involvement, if you get an asylum seeker that presents at the Home Office uh, in Belfast or, or any police station within uh, Northern Ireland, there's an initial assessment carried out by the Home Office. And then what happens is, um, on the back of that initial assessment, those service users are categorised as something called Section um, 98, whereby we have an obligation uh, to accommodate um, those service users in what would normally be called initial accommodation, but given the um, influx, sorry, the increase in hotels, it's, it's all labelled as um, contingency accommodation. And during that period, service users are accommodating it in, in contingency accommodation. Um, the Home Office works to basically uh, see whether those uh, service users um, can be um, basically, well, the way it works is the Home Office have to work out whether those service users would be destitute if they no, no longer required or were given home office support 
Um, when the Home Office has done that, uh, that evaluation, they are moved on to something called Section 95, at which point um, they can be uh, provided with dispersal accommodation. And at which point we provide dispersal accommodation for the service users, we carry out further induction and signposting. Um, once they're in dispersal accommodation and you, you move along that bottom line, um, there continues to be the system of um, assessment and application. And the end of the process for me as a service user is when um, the service user gets a final decision on their um, application. So if they um, receive right to remain, um, there's a process of what's called discontinuation. Um, they no longer become the responsibility of me as um, but they are, um, uh, they are, they have got kind of um, a possibility, or, or they will have um, kind of support under un, un, other schemes, and be um, uh, they will be available to to get sort of um, accommodation through um, the the Northern Irish um, Housing Executive. But I think it's just very important to highlight that our responsibility for service users is while they're in the asylum process, um, and that's the distinction between asylum process and uh, right to remain and, and refugees. Um, shall I go on to the final slide? So briefly, just to just to sort of cover off um, this presentation, um, whilst they're in our care, um, we have a number of different um, types of staff who are responsible for various different um, things within the process. Um, Daryl Smith, who's on holiday, is uh, our contract delivery director in Northern Ireland, who's responsible for the Northern Ireland contract. And under Daryl, um, there's a number of different um, kind of uh, staff members, repairs and maintenance people who go out and repair and maintain properties, um, landlord relationship leads who have um, relationships with uh, landlords as, uh, as, as indicated. But I think the two key roles within the system are housing managers and welfare managers. Housing managers generally take responsibility for making sure the accommodation uh, which we provide to uh, service users is up to standard and they'll visit each service user in each property um, on a monthly basis uh, to check uh, that all is okay. And we have a, another level of resident welfare managers who will be allocated specifically to any service users who we think have um, some kind of enhanced vulnerabilities um, and require an additional level of support, whether that be signposting to services um, or working alongside those, uh, those service users. So that's a very, very brief um, indication of our staffing structure. And that's um, a quick sort of whistle stop tour through um, Mia's responsibilities. Obviously happy to take um, any questions. Okay, thank you very much for that, Ray. I'm happy to open it up to the floor then for questions. Uh, the first indicated speaker from the previous deputation is Alderman McCready. So uh, back to you, Ryan, if you want to come in. Thanks, Chair. I'm going to hold. Let Lillian come in after her, please. Sorry, Ryan, we missed that. What was what did you say? Can I hold back until Lillian speaks, please? Okay. Uh can I trust you bar? Go ahead, Lillian. Thank you, Chair, for letting me in again. Um, this is the situation where Councillor uh, Donnelly was caught on when he made a comment about what we are told here and the reality on the ground is two different things. And this is absolutely true when it comes to me as some of you may recall reading an article in November 2021 where I raised serious concerns on asylum housing situation, having been contacted by multiple people seeking asylum in Belfast. I was first, uh, the story that caught my eye was a story of a family of seven with three children under 12 years living in slum like conditions where water was leaking into the properties electric leaving them feeling very unsafe. Now, Mears was responsible for this mess. And uh, just for a brief background, Mears were given a 10 year contract by the Home Office to provide housing and social services to asylum seekers in Belfast. And these services now have been extended to other towns in Northern Ireland, including here, our council area. And um, let me first welcome the geographical spread of this accommodation, because we've been asking for this for a very long time to make sure that asylum seekers are integrated in every part of Northern Ireland. 
And uh, this is a good development uh, for us here in the city to have MIAs now contracting our businesses here in town. But today's presentation, we have been informed that contracts places greater emphasis in standards of homes and recognition of vulnerability of people being housed and a need to meet their needs. I must say the evidence is contrary to the reality uh, on what we are told here. And I would urge every member here to just Google the word MIAs and asylum accommodation. What you will read will be shocking. You will come across articles such as home office landlord MIAs leaves asylum seekers without electricity and water. And here close to home, I've already highlighted one that we highlighted last year. So I have a few questions that I would like answers. And I would like to know from MIAs, what assurances can MIAs give to council that they will not repeat their dreadful contact in Derry? And while I acknowledge that currently you are using hotels, can you provide details of how you are going to inspect and repair private sector units before the asylum seekers arrive? Because you've given this information and you would know how many you'll be housing. And can you give assurances that you will provide appropriate furniture, bedding, cleaning materials, and essential items as, such as utensils if you happen to use the private sector? And how are you making sure that landlords are providing these uh, services and every essential item that is required by asylum seekers? I'm also curious, apart from accommodation, what other services are you providing to asylum seekers? And not just depending on community sector, on voluntary sector to just chip in when you are given billions and billions of money to support these people who are very vulnerable. And finally, do you have a proper complaint procedures in place to ensure uh, you are made accountable for inferior services or inadequate accommodation? Because we have so many asylum seekers who are already vulnerable and very scared of speaking up about their experiences uh, and uh, you basically taking advantage of their fear. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you for that, Lillian. And there's, there's a range of questions there, Ray, for you to pick up in due course. Um, we'll go through the list of the indicator speakers and then I'll bring you back in, uh, Ray, to, to, to answer the questions that have been put. Um, Alderman McCready, do you wish to come in now? Yes, thank you, Chair. Okay, go ahead. And you can see why I afforded the uh, opportunity for the previous member to speak and the, the key word which I was looking at uh, doing a bit of pre-reading prior to this is is assurances and the reputation of, of mayors precedes them but that reputation is not uh, a glowing one and yes these are huge contracts you know the, these are exceptionally high and the longer they have them and the more work that they need to do to um, to remediate properties or or services or issues, it eats into their profit margins uh, considerably. So I haven't seen anything what has been presented so far to give me a reassurance to say that they're going to do anything differently. And so what is the mechanism for external validation and external assurances to check that mirrors are actually op operating within their obligations within this contract so that the, the, those that are most vulnerable looking for these services aren't forgotten about. So it's mainly just I want that mechanism and the framework of external validation and assurances separate from those that are employed by MIRS. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thanks, Alderman McCready. Uh, Councillor Donnelly, Gary, go ahead. Chair, um, look, a number of the points that I was going to make have already been made by Alderman McCready and Councillor uh, Sinai Barr. But again, you know, it's dealt with uh, Mears' reputation. And, and you know, I've, I've had a number of phone calls uh, last week by somebody who uh, deals with people who who uh, have been, uh, you know, connected to the, the, the Mears, and it's not a good reputation. But let's be honest, you know, this, this contract was awarded by the Tories, the present Tory government. Uh, you know, so it, it, it's it's very very questionable. You Mears is there to make a profit, and some of the concerns that I would just mention that that haven't been dealt with. You know, it works with private rental properties. We already have a massive crisis, and 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 for uh, you know, 
for proper integration and, and, and you know, making sure that people who did make them dangerous journeys and who are vulnerable and who are damaged either, you know, from what they've been through are properly integrated and integrated where there's proper, you know, services for them, whether that be school places, whether it be, you know, access to GP or the health services and social housing. But my concern here is that mayors, you know, will will take over hotels, will block book hotels, and possibly make the staff redundant. Uh, they they may, you know, block book property portfolios, and and you know, there and if that happens, you see the people that's in some of them property portfolios if they're in, in temporary or emergency accommodation, it would be very easy for for mayors to just put them out because they don't have a tenancy; they have what's called a license and and you know a license only allows or you know the 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 person who owns the property or the landlord to give the person reasonable packing up time so there's massive massive issues here uh there's a lot of an awful lot of concern and you know what can mirrors say here today that's going to alleviate some of them concerns thank you Okay, thanks for that, Gary. And then the final indicator speaker is Alwyn Devaney. Marsh, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in. And on behalf of the DEP, can I welcome everyone um, who has given us a, a presentation here today, a very, very in-depth presentation on the, pro on the process uh, and around all of these issues, um, whether you're asylum seeker or refugee or whatever it is. Uh, and I do take on board in the first presentation there were really concerns from Councillor Lillian Barr and around the language barrier. And I think that is one uh, uh, serious issue because if people are left with phones or what devices, how do they know who to contact? And I believe that's something that needs to be addressed. And around the, you know, I heard Councillor Donnelly um, talking about some people having to be moved, I think, did he say in a skeleton or somewhere? That is nothing new for us here in this council because um, even our local people here um, who have to go into temporary and accommodation I have had constituents of mine who have came to me um, who lived uh, in the waterside have been asked to, to go to Larne uh, and Carrick Ferguses. So that is something you, and I do believe that has to stop, um, you know, because we have vulnerable people there and, and taking them out of their zone uh, is always, always very, very difficult. But in around the, the, the Mayor's presentation, um, I do take on board the, the concerns in around that have been highlighted here um, by Councillor Sine Barr and around Mayor's. And look, I, I'm just asking for the same assurances as some of the previous um, speakers in around what uh, assurances are they given us that these properties will be up to standard and the services will be deliverable there. And, uh, you know, it's something that's vitally, vitally important because you know if they go whether that be in the private sector or the hotel sector whatever it is you know we have to ensure that those properties are up to a standard and of a good standard that people can live in because we listen too many times um, even from our local people in difficulties here when they move to as i said Larn or carrick Ferguson, whatever it is some of the accommodation that they've been moved to is atrocious uh, and should, uh, is totally unacceptable but you know you know, at the end of the day, what I'm asking here is just to, for mayors to give us the assurance that their properties are assessed and everything in around that is assessed um, for the best the, uh, service to be delivered for these vulnerable people coming to live uh, in the properties. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, uh, Alderman Devaney, for that as well. Uh, Ray, there's been a number of comments there that uh, I'm sure you'll want to pick up and, and, and respond to. So uh, back to yourself for a, a response. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I, okay. Just let's just start with um, hotels. I'll work backwards to uh, dispersal accommodation. I think the um, the numbers we've dealt with and the um, the numbers entering the asylum system over the last few few months and years have been pretty unprecedented. So hotels have been the least worst option. Um, we are in a position where we'd love to be out of hotels tomorrow. Um, that's clearly not going to happen uh, overnight. But I think I just want to be absolutely clear is we've we've never failed to house someone. So, you know, over the last 24 months when we've had this, this huge influx of numbers, and we can talk, I suppose, into the night about the reason for the numbers and the, the, the reasons for the pressure on the system, but we have always housed service users. Um, 
if anybody has got any evidence of that not being the case or others, um, I think there was a discussion there about us potentially evicting people or using licenses and not giving, giving people security of tenure, then that is not what we do. Um, and that is not how the contract works. So our obligation um, to the Home Office is to house people entering in within the asylum system. And, and that's what we do. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, situations where we haven't. So to so please, um, perhaps outside of, of this meeting, um, if there are, um, you think, any examples of that, then, then please uh, get in touch with me personally and I will I will explore them. Um, I'm going to defend the reputation of me as you'd, you'd expect me to. I don't think I'll give you all assurance and, and I know given the strength of the feeling. Um, a couple of points to make is that I did mention in the presentation that the dispersal accommodation does have to meet certain standards that are laid down by the Home Office. Um, that um, standard is, is set out um, in a document called Schedule 2, which is the Statement of Requirements. And that does make pretty specific um, or does provide pretty specific obligations on MIRS in terms of inventory in, in, uh, in houses, in terms of the basic condition of houses. Um, and it does um, give us um, very sort of robust categories we've, we've got to respond to that if a service user um, has an issue um, in one of their houses, then they've got every right to um, make a complaint um, or request a maintenance visit to that property. They do so uh, through the um, air provider, which is Migrant Help. And then we are then on the clock to respond uh, to those uh, requests. We have uh, category one, two, and three um, repairs and maintenance issues. As you'd expect, category ones need to be uh, responded to within four hours if it's an emergency. Um, and then they all go all the way out to category three repairs, which uh, have got to be responded into within um, 28 days. Um, we are subject to inspection um, by the Home Office. Um, and we do have, um, I think, a very robust complaints process um, that is specified within the contract. There is a slight complication in the contract in that, um, generally speaking, when a service user um, has an issue with the service or with a, with a, with a, um, a house, um, they are generally channeled towards this organization called Migrant Help, and they make uh, their complaint to Migrant Help in the first instance, and then Migrant Help's job uh, is to categorize that um, issue and then pass it over uh, to, to Mears. So that, that is a, a, a slight sort of um, kind of quirk in this, in this contract. Um, and we do, um, and I have been involved in responding to a number of um, MPs' concerns um, because clearly service users have got every right, just like everybody else, to make complaints in that, in that usual way. So I think I'd defend the reputation of Mears. I think it'd be very difficult um, of me um, in this forum to respond to specific examples um, that clearly I'm quite happy to do outside of this forum. Um, but the contractual arrangements, I think, and our contract with the Home Office is, I think, very robust in terms of the standard of accommodation we should provide to service users. I think the final point I've made, uh, or I will make, is that this issue of support and signposting, um, it is accommodation and support um, contract. The support generally is specified in the contract is around signposting and that's signposting to local services. Um, and we do recognize the impact that our vulnerable cohort has on various communities. Um, so we work alongside um, uh, local authorities, the voluntary sector to help provide services uh, for those service users. But I think it's, it's very, very important to highlight that the the way that's specified in our contract is we signpost to those to those local services. Okay, thank you, uh, Ray, for that. Um, I'm conscious that there's a, a number of indicator speakers who want to come back in again, um, uh, so I'll take them through the order that they've come in. So, um, Councillor McGowan, John, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh, listen, that was very useful, Ray, but can I just state here as a party that we won't be allowing mayors or anybody to put asylum seekers on the poor housing stock across the city. 
So we, we will work uh, very closely with the housing executive who are ultimately responsible for ensuring HMOs are checked and meet the highest standards. So anything we do here locally, I think it's uh, it's important that we uh, allow any of these asylum seekers a form. If there's any issues with housing, they bring them to us and we will look under it. But just putting it here on the record, there'd be absolutely uh, no doubt that any housing stock in this city will be ensuring that it's up to standards because the last thing we want is vulnerable people being housed in homes that are substandard. So we'll just put that on the record. Thank you. Okay, John, thanks for that. Um, Deborah, you indicated you'd like to come back on some of the points that might be helpful. So go ahead, Deborah. Thank you. Hi, yes, thank you. It was just um, some of the points that were raised related to different agencies and departments across the executive. So um, just one thing to be aware of is that, um, as Ray had said, the housing of asylum seekers is the responsibility of mayors while they're in the asylum application process. There were a couple of points raised which I think might have related uh, to where people are in the move on process and they have maybe got status and they're moving back into housing executive accommodation or moving on to a homelessness list. But I suppose those comments are, they highlight the breadth of the services that have to be around the table when we're having these discussions. So uh, mayors have the housing element for this, as they mentioned, even within that contract, there is then um, uh, a kind of a link across to the AIRE, which is the advice issue reporting and eligibility contract, which is held by Migrant Help under Bryson here. So there are a number of different strands, but um, in talking about specifically the engagement with councils, the group that is going to be set up now with uh, Darien Strand District Council will be looking at representation from officials and voluntary and sector community organisations and will have representation from the Home Office and Mayors and TEO will be on that as well and we will link in with the Western Trust and the local PSNI and the local housing executive people and education authority to be on that group and that will be an ongoing engagement group at least for the first whatever number of months to look specifically at this council area. So any issues that come up in terms of the rollout of the contract can be brought to that as well. So um, absolutely, um, councillors, you know, you will have individuals come to you as well, potentially, but just to be aware that that group is there and the purpose of that is to make sure that if there are things that come up that are the responsibility of departments or other agencies that we raise those there. That is the kind of operational group at a council level, and those are in place in a number of council areas now. They then would feed into the overall strategic planning group, which looks across the departments to say, look, this issue is coming up in a number of areas, or we're aware of something broader, and that's then taken forward kind of more broadly. But that local group, that's where we want to be picking up those issues. So we would really encourage all of the voluntary and community sector groups that as they as they run into particular issues, I think bring that to our attention because that's the group that we want to be able to kind of keep our ear to the ground on how the contract unfolds there um, and what uh, roles the executive departments have as well in supporting that because, um, you know, as, as Lillian had alluded to as well, we know there are particular issues in relation to healthcare and accessing health screening, and that will be why we'll need the Western Trust on that group too, because the experience of health screening services is predominantly in Belfast, and um, the Northern Ireland New Entrance Service is in Belfast, and not all, well, the other trusts don't have that service, so they are developing their approach as this unfolds. Deborah, thanks for that. That's quite uh, a useful intervention. So appreciate the, the additional commentary. Um, going back then to a supplementary from uh, Alderman McCready. Go ahead, Ryan. Thanks, Chair. Uh, my original question hasn't been answered yet. Um, so yes, I appreciate the update on the clarification on standards, criterion, and the categories, which I'm well aware of. My question was what mechanisms are in place to conduct external validation and assurances on mayors to to hold them to account to those set standards, criteria and categories. And the input from Deborah was appreciated on, on that local operational group, whether it's a snag group or uh, to challenge things locally. It, is there room for council officers or elected reps or representation from elected councillors to sit on that? And is the purpose of that group to challenge and hold you to account whilst you're operating in our council area? Thanks, Chair. Okay, thanks. I'll pick in uh, up 
uh, Lillian again and then I'll bring back in uh, Ray uh, or Deborah to answer those points. Lillian, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Um, actually, Ryan McCreeley has just asked what I wanted to ask because I think the questions that I asked have not been answered, particularly on the complaint procedures. And uh, thanks, Debbie, for coming up. But I, I have to say we shouldn't be waiting for issues to occur. Mia's is a, has been contracted by the Home Office, given billions of money to provide quality services, particularly on housing. We shouldn't be waiting for issues to be brought to us. We should make sure that asylum seekers, people who are already vulnerable, have good, comfortable homes when they get here. So if you've chosen hotels, you make sure they provide, they get all the support that they need and the items that are required. If you provide, if you've chosen private sector, you make sure that they are standard, high quality homes like everybody else. And that's the point. We can create all working groups as we wish, but that does not solve the problem. The problem needs to be solved because working groups are just going to be the same process of complaints and complaints. It's prevention that we need, and this is the time to do it. Okay, thanks, Sean. And um, Councillor Mooney has indicated he wishes to come in as well. Go ahead, Sean. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's just uh, to welcome the presentations, but also just on a, on a more local point, um, listening to these matters, I was contacted today by a local group who are keenly support Ukrainian refugees, but on the, on the, the question about what our council area is doing, I've just a question to the executive. Do we have a nominated officer dealing with this aspect who's going to tie in so we can maybe make contact if we have any sort of representations from local local community groups? Thank you, Chair. Through well, you, Chair, um, we have a sub team set up within council comprising officers, including myself, uh, from a range of uh, departments. Our nominated lead at this moment in time is Denise McDonald, um, but we will be reviewing that as we go forward because there's, uh, it's probably more appropriate it will sit within community services. But just right now, from an emergency planning perspective, uh, Denise is taking an overall coordination role, both in terms of keeping in touch with the executive office, the home office. Uh, both in relation to the Ukrainian situation and the asylum seekers situation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for that, John. Um, okay, I'm going to hand back to Ray and Deborah again to see if there's any uh, additional points that they wish to make in response to the questions posed by the elected representatives. Yeah, sure. There's just two or three. I think there was a, um, a view there. If we choose hotels, just have to be brutally honest. We're, we're not choosing hotels. I think we've reflected on the fact that across the UK, it's the least worst option. Um, and that in in very, very basic terms, I think over the last certainly six to 12 months in Northern Ireland, and certainly in the last 24 months, has been the only accommodation we could use um, to cope with the demand in the system. So it's not really a case of us choosing hotels, but what I would reiterate is there is a process we go through. Um, we check out hotels. We go through a process with the Home Office to check those hotels are safe and compliant. We base resident welfare managers in those hotels and we make sure as far as practicable um, that service users are comfortable and certainly safe and secure uh, whilst they're housing hotels. But I will absolutely accept that hotels are not the best environment and for reasons I've hopefully explained, we've had people uh, whose lengths of stay uh, in those hotels has been perhaps a lot longer than anybody would have uh, envisaged or, or hoped for. In terms of the dispersal accommodation, we'd absolutely expect you to hold us to account in terms of, um, you know, I don't want to be here in, well, three months, six months or 12 months time um, defending Mia's reputation and having to answer uh, queries about poor accommodation. So in terms of the way the accommodation um, selection process works, there are controls in terms of putting these um, proposed um, units or, or houses in front of NIHI, in front of um, PSNI and getting feedback on them. And we would not use accommodation which is either unsuitable, unsafe or insecure. Um, we are held to account by the Home Office in terms of the standard of that accommodation. And for each new unit we bring on, we've got um, a pretty detailed checklist that we go through backed up by photographs that demonstrates the accommodation is in the accommodation it should be 
at the outset of the contract. I think there was a query raised about not waiting for um, service users to complain, and I agree. Um, we have the um, monthly visits conducted by the housing managers um, who are required to pick up on any issues um, within, within those properties. But I think it is important to reiterate that the whole uh, Bryson Migrant Help Service is meant to hold us to account. Um, so under the previous Compass contracts, I think there was, a, there was a sense that if service users were in substandard accommodation, uh, there, was, there was difficulty or there was obstacles in them finding a route through to complain or raise issues in, the, in those, uh, those units. And the whole purpose, I think, of the air provider uh, migrant help has been that that's the channel uh, for uh, service users to raise maintenance requests, issues and or complaints about um, properties. We do have, I think, finally, a robust com complaints process. Um, so I'm quite happy, um, perhaps on the back of uh, this, this presentation and meeting, um, and if we can submit um, that process through uh, via the correct channels, I, th I think it'd be very difficult to to do such a thing as a complaints process just this uh, in a sort of two minute response to a question. But I, I've heard that now a couple of times, and I'm quite happy to provide any any further detail that's uh, that's required. Thanks. Okay, Deborah, is there anything that you wish to add uh, before we bring this part of the meeting to a close? The only thing I would add there is in relation to oh sorry i'm getting a lot of feedback the only thing i'd like to add is um just in relation to um councillor senoibar and councillor mccready's points around the role of the working group and the membership of the working group um for your council area yes officials will be on that in fact it's officials that i will be meeting with at the beginning of next week to look at who they would suggest should be on the membership of that we don't have a standardized template for each council area to say this is who you must have on it because each council works in a slightly different way and they have links into different organisations. So we will be led by the council officials in terms of that. Um, and secondly, the other thing is, I mean, in complete agreement, we want to prevent the issues before they arise. But from my point of view and my area of work, um, this working group is as much to see that as the contract unfolds as well that we have a mechanism for raising issues with not just mayors in the home office but also where there are those interactions for example you mentioned the um kind of approvals or inspection process for the housing executive of hmos things like that for for there to be a discussion at a local level in terms of making sure that um you know everybody is carrying out those roles and to raise any issues that come up because um as mayors have said previously that they the intention isn't to suddenly move in a huge number of people it is to move them in in a phased approach into the council area so we want to um you know you have that group in from the beginning to be able to monitor how that is going and um the within the different agencies around the table there will be different um, people around that table who will have different aspects of responsibility for supporting the asylum seekers in the accommodation so it's not solely about the accommodation being provided but also the other services that they will need to access so that's why I suppose I'm saying that there is a need for that, not just as a working group, it's not a talking shop. It is very much about, you know, the um, trying to preempt and respond to issues at a local level. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, can I thank Deborah and Orla and Ray for uh, taking the questions and also obviously to the elected members uh, for uh, putting the points across uh, so well this afternoon. Uh, I think that there's clearly a need for uh, this conversation today to be a continuous one, so it would be useful in my view for elected members to get the contact details for those that are uh, on the presentation today, which I'm sure officers would be happy to circulate. I'm also conscious that there are other elected members from other parties who aren't on this particular committee. Uh, and they may well be asking for that when we reach full council. Uh, but for today's purposes, just again to thank uh, everyone who has contributed to the debate over the last hour or so. Uh, and uh, those that are online uh, for that uh, as part of the deputation, if you wish to log out of WebEx now, our meeting has been broadcast live on YouTube. So if you want to log out and go on to YouTube to watch from the council's website, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, but if you use exit the portal now, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.
but we'll just give it a moment then for uh, IT to confirm that we can move on to the next stage. Members, item six is the next item on the agenda, which is chairperson's business. Uh, just uh, two items. First of all, uh, as this is my last meeting as chair of the committee, can I thank uh, all of you as elected members, uh, uh, some of whom I've seen face to face and so, some of whom I've seen uh, on the WebEx portal. But regardless of the method of uh, contact over the past 12 months, I want to thank you all for uh, the conduct of the committee over the past 12 months, I think, has been uh, a very useful uh, uh, way of doing business, and uh, and I appreciate everybody's co cooperation uh, in, in the running of the agenda uh, over the past year. As part of that, I also want to thank the committee, the committee staff, uh, and the senior officer team who kept me right over this past 12 months as well. Uh, and also thanks to uh, the deputy chair, Alderman McClintock, who I've had to rely on from time to time to, to assist with uh, chairing the meeting when required. So uh, just to put that on record as uh, as I exit the chair uh, of this committee uh, at this time. Um, the second item on the on chairperson's business was um, uh, Alderman De Benny uh, wished to come in. So go ahead, Marsh. Thank you, Chair. And can the DP just put on record um, their thanks to you and the manner you have carried out your job uh, in chairing this committee? Um, you've been very a very very fair um, chair and a very very accommodating chair. But just our thanks to you for your year. Um, as chair, but look, uh, as we look, uh, as you're exiting um, your chair role, uh, your deputy chair is exiting politics. And look, on behalf of our party, would like to thank um, Alderman McClintock for the time and effort she's put on this last eight years. She served as mayor, served in numerous committees uh, and chaired committees. Uh, you know, has been a, a great stalwart um, for for the DUP. And look, um, we we all know Hillary uh, and around the chamber now, most of us. And look, for me, myself, I just want to say I um, wish Hillary all the best uh, as she moves into retirement and wish her well. And once again, from our party, thanks for all the work that you've done for us uh, in the past eight years. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in. Yeah, thanks very much, Mars. Um, I'm also uh, keen to uh, just record thanks to Alden McClintock for her years of public service uh, in this council uh, and indeed the legacy council as well. Uh, she served uh, the people of the Waterside so well over this past uh, good number of council terms. Uh, I've worked with her as a Waterside councillor on a range of issues, not just in the patch of the water side that she's uh, well uh, accustomed to in terms of Drumahoe, but wider afield right across the council area. And as a fellow group leader, uh, I want to thank her for her uh, assistance in that role, as well as uh, in the councillor role uh, that she has performed also. So uh, best wishes, Hilary, uh, in your retirement. Um, next indicator speaker on this item is Councillor Duffy. Sandra, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in and just to put on record, um, Sinn Féin's thanks to yourself as well. As Chair, over the past year, you have been um, a very efficient and very accommodating Chair, as um, Alderman Devaney has outlined, and I thank you for that. Um, just in terms of Alderman McClintock's retirement, I, I wish to put it on record. Our best wishes to Hillary um, going forward and to her, her and her family. Um, as you've alluded to in terms of the group leader role, um, myself and Hillary might not always have seen IDA or our party certainly not seen IDA, but we have had occasion to come together as group leaders to, to find solutions um, at times. And I, I remember on one occasion it was um, around the Christmas signage and myself and Hillary came together. We, we agreed quite quickly in terms of what we were going to do and how we remarked around um, how two women can get business done. So I would just like to put that on record. Um, but I, I have had a really good working relationship with Hillary over the years. Um, I've always found her very fair, very open-minded um, and very solution-focused around the work that she's done. And in her time as mayor and how she conducted herself in, in local communities, um, she was very caring and you, you could see that coming across. So I wish her um, all the best in her retirement and spending some valuable time with her family. So, um, best wishes, Hilary. 
Thanks uh, for that, Councillor Duffy. Uh, Alderman McCready, Ryan. Thanks, Chair. Just like to place on record on behalf of the Austrian Unionist Party uh, for yourself as uh, chairing the Governance Strategic Planning Committee over the last year. It's been a pleasure from my end uh, listening to you. Um, your conduct was exceptional, uh, so you can be proud of, of your tenure there. Uh, so just make sure that's recorded, please. Secondly, I'd just like to wish Alderman McClendick all the very best in her next venture uh, in retirement or outside of politics. She's been a, an incredibly astute councillor, uh, one that I have learned from, uh, both while serving alongside her as a colleague and indeed uh, a bit further afield in the Austrian Unionist Party. Uh, so she can hold her, hair, hell, her head held high. Um, she's a great example, I think a fantastic ambassador, not just for local people, but as a woman in politics. And so the very best to her and her next uh, new pastures, I suppose. So good luck. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Ryan. Uh, Gary, go ahead, Councillor Donnelly. Good morning, August, Chair. And Chair, just to thank you for your stewardship over the last year too, your chairmanship. And just to wish uh, Alderman Hilary McClintock all the best on her uh, retirement. And, and as we pointed out, it's not easy being a, a, a politician or sticking your head up. And, uh, you know, sometimes our, our female politicians get, you know, come in for a lot of abuse and, and stick in that. So it's not easy, but just just the place on record. I wish her all the best uh, on wherever she moves on to. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, for that. Uh, can I thank everybody who's expressed their good wishes to me? Thank you for those remarks. And I'll bring in Alderman McClintock now. Hilary, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I just I wasn't expecting all of this uh, today. Uh, I'm still there to the end of the week. But um, yes, I want to place on record my thanks to you as chair of the committee, as my colleague Morris has already done. So you haven't called on me too often as deputy chair. So it has been quite a very easy year. But I just want to thank all those who have wished me well today. Yes, I have reached the age when retirement does seem to be the only option. And just uh, that there have be no new ventures other than a few holidays that are in the in the. Um, in the coming days, but thank you for all your good wishes, and I certainly remember the conversation with uh, Councillor Duffy very well. Um, and I remember down in Bay Road, and yes, we sort we sorted something out in minutes. And we thought all council could be done like that. We both went in, into it with a will to find a solution, and I think that's often the best way to conduct uh, politics. But thank you all for your good wishes, and I have enjoyed my time in politics. But all good things must come to an end. So thank you very much indeed. Okay, Hilary, thank you for those remarks. Uh, members, that moves us on then to item seven, which is the, the minutes of the uh, open minutes of the Government Strategic Planning Committee held on the 5th of April, uh, pages 19 to 40. So we'll take those first for accuracy. Any uh, proposers for accuracy, please? So proposed, Alderman Devaney. Thanks, and uh, Councillor Fleming here in the Chamber to second. Thank you. Uh, any matters arising that people wish to raise? Uh, Alderman Halsey, go ahead, Derek. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm not a member of the committee, but uh, like others, can I thank you for the opportunities that you've uh, allowed me to come in on. And uh, I'll say more about it later, but uh, not in this committee meeting. But uh, uh, I'm in a bit of shock here because I didn't realise Hilary was standing down. Uh, but I certainly wish her well going forward. Uh, under uh, GS67, which was the issue at Spamont, a reference to withdrawal of the um, the skip lorry there owing to an expired per permit. Can I put on record uh, my thanks and, and the thanks indeed of electors in the Derrick area for the uh, prompt action undertaken by, um, by council officers to ensure that that service was restored at the earliest. I can assure the officers it was much appreciated. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Derek. Um, uh, Councillor Doyle, Emmett, go ahead. Thanks, Martin. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I'm, uh, I'm on the train at the moment. And if, uh, if you can, indeed, I wish to just echo what uh, other members have said uh, about your own tenure as, as chair, and also to wish uh, Alderman McClintock uh, all the very best. Um, and the conversations I've had with her, um, I've certainly learned a fair, uh, a fair few bits about. Uh, uh, the real politic, and uh, I wish her and her family all the very best going forward. Um, Chair, I, um, as I think we all were, were very frustrated at the 
meeting that we have with Firmus. Um, but certainly today, um, I do think that we have to hold them to account uh, even further. Um, and I just want to, if I can, just uh, read something that um, Firmus actually put out um, on a public statement on the 4th of last month. Uh, with regards to price rises, uh, the quote has low storage levels and a lack of LNG, liquefied natural gas, made the market nervous regarding winter supply levels in the run up to winter 21 22 contract starting. This pushed prices up. Now, this morning on uh, Sky News, uh, there was a report on uh, gas prices, um, and they have been quoted as now the lowest in 18 months. Um, and to put that in context, in December 2020, um, gas was 47p per therm. Apologies for the background noise. Um, it's now less than 2p higher than that, uh, against a price of around 300 pence per therm in March 2022. Um, and the prices have not been lowered for domestic customers. Um, it is absolutely infuriating that that hasn't been uh, the case. So I'd like to ask uh, two things and to make a short proposal. One, can we find out from officers if possible where our uh, complaint with the Competition and Markets Authority is, uh, where our complaint with the uh, Energy Regulator is, um, and I'd like us to write to Firmus um, to tell them to get their act together, um, as well as any other companies that uh, offer domestic gas services uh, to tell them to bring their prices down, um, because at this point, uh, it can only be described um, as over greed. I'm going to put that in the chat box. Uh, Chair, thank you. This train is for. Okay, Councillor Doyle, if you want to put that into the chat box, and in the meantime, um, perhaps officers, officers might be in a position to respond to the questions that were asked. Um, I think we'll. Okay, officer indicating that they'll, they'll go away, Emmett, and, and find out and then we'll, we'll respond back to you in due course. Um, just give us a moment here to see your proposal. Uh, if the committee section can bring it up onto the, the screen, please. If uh, if the committee section can just grab yep and put it up on the screen for people in the room to read. Thank you. So it's been proposed. So we'll just wait a moment for people to have a look through it here, and then I'll call for a seconder. Connor, yeah, go ahead, Connor. Yeah, happy to second, sir. Okay, members. Um, it's been proposed and seconded. Uh, I don't see anyone looking to come in to speak in relation to it, so we're going to take that as approved. If anyone is against it, now is your chance to indicate opposition to it. So we'll just give it a moment in the chat box to see if anybody comes in. And I don't see anyone coming in, so I'm going to take, treat that as, as approved, Councillor Doyle, um, and uh, move on to the next item. I think that concludes matters arising uh, from the minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, the next item is item eight, which is the UK Leveling Up Fund round two. I'm going to hand over to Richard. Thank you, Chair. Um, the purpose of this report is to update members on round two of the uh, UK government's levelling up fund and seek members' approval on uh, potential projects for submission. Uh, members will be aware um, that uh, in the last, in the first round, sorry, um, council submitted three projects which were all successful, securing approximately 16.3 million um, for the council and for the, the, the district. Um, all three projects, um, obviously, that's a tremendous achievement um, for, for an outcome for the Council, and all three projects are now in the delivery phase, and indi individual update reports are being brought to um, relevant committees as the projects progress. Um, just to recap on the fund, this is the, the 4.8 million uh, billion um, fund across uh, the, the UK. Um, 
and uh, this now is the round two, which was launched on the 23rd of March. Um, again, this, the, the investments themes are the same as round one, um, focusing on transport, regeneration, uh, and town centre investment and cultural investment, um, including um, this also includes cultural and sporting assets. Um, as with uh, round one, the fund is being administered by uh, the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. Um, and uh, this differs, um, again, from the approach in, in uh, the rest of uh, the devolved nations in that uh, local authorities are responsible for leading and coordinating bids in their respective areas. Um, in uh, Northern Ireland, the bids will be submitted directly to DLUC, and in terms of eligibility, that remains the same. Um, it's quite a broad spectrum, including businesses, voluntary and community sector, um, district councils, uh, the executive for transport only, and other public um, uh, bodies that meet uh, the, the eligibility criteria. Um, some key points in terms of the, the timelines and uh, criteria. Um, submission is, deadline is the 6th of July um, this year, at 12 noon. Um, in terms of expenditure, um, the, uh, it's, it's um, very similar to round one in that all expenditure has to be incurred by the 31st of March, 25. And exceptionally for more larger complex projects on the, uh, by the um, uh, 26. Um, the allocation for Northern Ireland this time around um, it, it, it is 95 million. Um, it has been indicated this is actually a minimum amount, not a maximum. Um, so there is potential for um, greater investment across uh, the region if um, the luck receives suitable and eligible product, uh, projects. Um, in terms of bid value, again, that remains the same. Maximum um, for um, up to 20 million per bid. And for cultural and transport themes, with exception, they, they will uh, consider projects of 20 million above up to a maximum of, of 50 million. Um, no restrictions on the number of bids um, in terms of that any organisation can submit. Um, in terms of key issues, uh, officers have been working to identify potential and viable uh, and realistically deliverable projects for council for round two that meet all the parameters as set out by the, uh, the, the Department for Leveling Up and Housing Communities. Um, members will appreciate that, uh, again, the, 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 the timeline is very pressured, both in terms of uh, for the submission deadline and for delivery of the projects. Um, in terms of uh, the potential projects um, and the, the sifting criteria, again, this remains largely unchanged from round one, um, particular focus on project status in terms of project readiness, um, information available, i.e. business cases um, and designs, planning status and deliverability in terms of um, the technical development of, of individual projects. On the uh, basis of the above um, uh, restrictions and challenges and subject to, to further development and uh, deliverability and procurement considerations within the, the given timeframes, officers are proposing um, that uh, Council submits four bids and that the, the bids that are being proposed are Straban uh, Leisure Centre. So, as members well will be aware, it's a new leisure centre to replace the current Riversdale Centre and is the anchor project for the Straban Town Centre Master Plan located in the Canal Basin. Um, the second project is the Craigland Reservoir, um, bid value of around circa five million, and this uh, will focus on the development and enhancement of the Craigland Reservoir. Um, as members will be aware, there's some critical works that will need to be carried out um, and that, um, it, with, with the responsibility on, on onus on, on council to deliver that, um, and that's in the region of, of one million. This bid will allow um, council to uh, put in a, wide, a wider, more um, um, ambitious proposal in terms of re redeveloping um, the reservoir and park. The third project is a program of, of play provision. Um, with the ambition to deliver one to two play parks in each of the DEA um, areas within the, the council area. And the fourth project is um, continued investment in, in our greenways infrastructure um, in, in the northwest greenways across the, the, the district and council area. Um, Members should be um, should members be content. Then uh, further details on uh, all of the projects will be put before the relevant uh, service committees as the projects and bids become further developed. 
um, in terms of financial uh, equality, legal and HR matters. Um, again, members will be asked to note that the funding rules of the fund stipulate that any remaining expenditure overspend requires beyond the date set out will have to be funded by the project promoters. Um, therefore, this re represents a financial risk which may potentially need to be considered in due course. Um, Council have received development funding from LUF of £125,000 um, um, for round two projects. Um, uh, and in summary, just the council obviously we intend to use that to to um, develop and uh, take the, the the four bids forward um, for the for round two. Um, a minimum of ten percent match funding contribution will be will be required in order for any bids to be successful. It's there, therefore proposed that a sum of one point five million is ring fenced from council's uh, twenty two twenty three capital budget in relation to the play program, greenways, and. Craigan Reservoir proposals, and a sum of 4.6 million is ring fenced from Council's un unallocated loan charge provision for the Straban Leisure Project. Um, obviously, should the bids not be successful, these funds will be made available um, for other priorities. A capital working group will be arranged with members in the coming weeks to discuss wider capital program prioritisation in light of the challenging financial environment. Um, members are therefore asked to note the current position in relation to the, the LUF round two and endorse the progression of the proposals, um, the proposed projects as highlighted in the report and ring fence the required match funding and contributions. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you, Richard, for that. Uh, there's a couple of indicated speakers, uh, Councillor Mooney, Councillor Duffy, and then Alderman McCready. Uh, go ahead, Sean. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to Richard for uh, presenting the report here to members today. Um, just to say it was a fantastic um, outcome to the initial round at the level up fund in October. As you know, £16 million, uh, investment was um, sought and gained for the Daisy Field project, Derek Active and the Acorn Farm, which is at St. Columns Park. And I'm sure we'll be hoping for a similar success uh, in the next round. Um, on the presentation today, these are very sensible and deliverable um, proposals, which could potentially result in some £38 million investment for our city and district, namely, as outlined by Richard, the new ledger centre at Straban, uh, a major investment at Craigan Reservoir, which would hopefully transform Craigan Country Park and uh, unlock the planning difficulties that surround it in relation to McGee and Fort George. Also, uh, further investment in our impressive greenway structures at the moment. And investment in our play parks for each DEA uh, across the city industry, which we know there's the current um, program is ongoing at the moment. But on that uh, last note there, Chair, um, the paper states uh, one or two play parks per DEA. Um, do we have any further detail on what that would actually include or look like, i.e. what would we be proposing for? Would it be maybe one or two and where would they be located? Because obviously this is a sort of um, significant um, proposal for our for our council going forward. Our current play park review is ongoing and it is a major infrastructure program that has been sought. And uh, if, if we could get more uh, detail on that and if there's any possibility of any further from relation to that, that would be great. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Sean. Sandra. Thank you, Chair and Richard. Thank you for the really comprehensive report. And it is really good to see the, the phase one um, projects moving forward, um, particularly, I suppose, around the Daisy Field and that. Um, it's good to see that investment coming in. And I do welcome the report here and all the, the projects that are outlined are really worthwhile projects and stuff that we have had on our capital list um, for quite some time. Um, and But I suppose the question that I, that I, I would just like answered is you have talked about um, our challenging financial environment and that you know the the circumstances that we're currently in we do have a really extensive um, capital list at the minute that that has huge ambition um, right across the city and district so I suppose I just want to understand a wee bit about how we came to the decision on the projects that are being put forward um, no I mean it, 
um, Councillor Mooney has outlined the, the play programme. Absolutely. And I, I do hope that that comes back to the capital group, that we are allowed to have a look at where the, the list of the play plan is and where the, the deficits are around where we, we can deliver some of those play provisions. But just um, to, ga to gain an understanding of how we came to that, when we do have such a huge list of um, capital priorities right across the area, I'm more than happy to second the, uh, the paper as it's going forward, but just want to understand how, how we reach the decisions. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Alderman McQueedy, and then I see the results of uh, Alderman Debenny and Hussey and Councillor Doyle. Turn on a range of speakers on this one, Richard. Uh, over to you, Ryan. Thanks, Chair. I appreciate the, the effort and background Richard put into the report. And I suppose the first thing is, the bar has been set incredibly high because of the success of the, the previous three uh, three projects, which were, were highlighted. Uh, and to that end, uh, you know, can we be more ambitious in terms of squeezing more of what is already on our list into this current one? Um, notwithstanding the financial pressures and the ten percent match funding that we have, the specifically on play parks, uh, I think it's a, pretty much the same question as. Uh, I think it was uh, Councillor Mooney. Which parks does this specify? Uh, how many parks in which DEA? And well, crucially, are those parks being selected based on the kind of play park review and that amber, green, red uh, list, which we were briefed in previous uh, committee meetings? Um, if so, I'd like to see more detail on that, so long as it doesn't hold back the, the, the preparations of, of the, the tight deadlines, which which are on this one, and the, that's I suppose that the play parks was was the the micro issue, but what's holding us back from putting more bids in this? Surely we've got a more capital projects which are meet the the kind of three point criteria, which have been set with the leveling up program, and you know so where are the pinch points? What decisions do we need to make to get more on this? To have more chance of getting. Uh, Deliver or more delivery for for the northwest. Uh, thanks, chair. Okay, Mars, go ahead. Thank you, chair, for uh, allowing me in, uh, and uh, I thank Richard for bringing forward the report here. It's a very very detailed report uh, um, uh, on where the the bid is going in for. And when you look at the the, the projects, the Savannah Leisure Centre, much needed, Craig and Reservoir, much needed, and uh, as previous speakers have mentioned, around and around the play program. It's an issue I've been banding on for quite a while now as being a rural councillor. And you know, and I think Councillor Duffy has mentioned it, you know, where and around the deficits where we, we don't have any play facilities. And you know, I welcome news as well. Look, uh, I think it's a good uh, one as well, uh, the expansion of the, the, the greenways. And Chair, uh, our party, DEP, has no problem uh, in supporting the recommendation here. And uh, look, um, uh, we hope lightning strikes twice. Um, when we looked at the last round, we got 16 million out of it, and hopefully we can return that back again this time for these um, four very, very worthwhile projects. But yes, interesting to see. Um, is it possible to squeeze in maybe a few more? Maybe there are regulations in around that, or costs, or whatever the case may be. But just wait on the answer. Thanks, Chair. Okay, Mars. Thank you, uh, Derek Alman Hussey. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to Richard for the report. Uh, and, you know, it's not just Richard, I'm sure he's the first to admit it. Uh, the team behind that, that have uh, gathered together the bids uh, to the levelling up fund or the second phase of it. A uh, couple of queries, Richard, on the presentation. Uh, you've rightly highlighted that transport is outside, basically, outside of the remit of ourselves as a council. Uh, but that said, Transport issues have raised their head within the chamber. Has there been any, or could there be any engagement with the likes of TransLink uh, to look at projects to improve the connectivity uh, throughout and within uh, the district council area? That would be the first point. Uh, secondly, on the play parks, endorse what others have already said with regard to play parks, uh, like Councillor Devaney and, and other rural councillors. As you know, this is something that has vexed me. Uh, for a considerable amount of time is the lack of provision 
uh, which has been clearly shown uh, within surveys, etc., and particularly in my own rural area. Uh, and when when I heard Richard saying, uh, you know, one or two in each EA, uh, well, surely the, the criteria should be the issue of need uh, and, and scored criteria as to where the, the worst uh, provision is needed uh, to be addressed. Um, administrative capacity came up under the first round of our successful um, our successful bids, and it was emphasised to us that this was having a tremendous burden, or well, a pleasant burden, if you wish, on, on our uh, administrative capacity. Uh, if we're successful, will there be the need then to improve uh, that capacity within administration uh, to move forward on the various capital projects that have been uh, suggested? And finally, uh, without wanting to pour uh, cold water, um, is there a danger that we could be victims of our own success? In other words, you know, you have been successful in round one. Uh, we'll be looking at other areas. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Derek, thanks for that. Uh, Councillor Doyle. Thank you, Chair. Again, apologies for the background noise. Sorry, yeah. Councillor Doyle. Um, thanks, Richard, just... and thanks to Elfie as well, who you have to thank you very much for here. Sorry, can you not hear me? We can, hear, we can hear you now. Go ahead, Emma. Okay, thanks, uh, Chair. Sorry about the. Yeah. Um, two things, and uh, one of them is to try and be crafty. Uh, and, we, we, Emma, uh, sorry, the, the signal is very patchy. Councillor Doyle, so if you. Emma, can you just bear with us? The signal is very patchy. So uh, there's been quite a few questions there for Richard. So uh, if Richard, if you want to start taking the, the, the questions along with the Chief Executive, and then Emmett, if you want to type up your question, even put it in the chat box if that works, uh, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Thanks. Chair, if I, if I may come in on a few of the questions and, and um, pass to Richard for, for some of them as well. Um, I think that one of the key issues was um, in terms of how the projects were chosen. And selected, and um, we had a number of meetings um, right across the various directorates um, to look at the. Our, our first port of call is the capital projects list, essentially. Um, those projects that members know that we're trying to find funding for to, to move forward, uh, and then applying the uh, criteria uh, for this particular fund against that list. Um, do they meet the various categories? Can they be delivered within the timeframes? Could we deliver them within the timeframes? Um, are they sufficiently advanced that um, we've got a, a chance and an ability to do that? So that, that that was a major consideration, probably the primary consideration. And of course, Straban Leisure Centre falls um, is, is, is right up there in terms of priorities, and it falls within uh, all of the criteria. and. Um, and it, it probably can be delivered within the time frame. I need to be careful what I say, open business. Um, but it's a, it's a challenge. But yeah, we think it does meet the criteria. In terms of play, I mean, every single member has mentioned play. Uh, and obviously, it's a big imperative in terms of our capital projects list. Um, so um, we have put down a number of play parks that we think can be delivered. By a number, I don't mean the locations, I mean you know, a, a numerical number in terms of what we think we can achieve during that period. We intend bringing forward into ENR um, a short list of the actual uh, locations for members to consider um, based on need, based on the play value, based on uh, the previous reports, but also based on a geographical distribution across the council area. And then it's up for members to decide whether that's the correct list or not. We are going to work on the funding application, assuming the principle is approved today. We're going to work on the funding application with, um, with some assumptions that we make as officers until we get that um, subsequent approval from yourselves, but hopefully that will be forthcoming. We're trying to make it as fair and balanced as possible. Um, in terms of the scale of the ambition, there's a couple of questions there that are broadly the same. Scale of the ambition, um, could we be more ambitious? And then Alderman Hussey's comment on 
um, could we be the vic a victim of our own success? Um, the honest answer is, you know, we, we don't know. Um, we have been incredibly successful in round one. There is a school of thought that might say we might um, not be as successful uh, in round two. You'll notice um, part of the criteria is to ensure a geographical distribution across Northern Ireland of, the, of, of this particular fund, um, which maybe wasn't necessarily the case in round one. Um, personally, we've debated this quite a lot as an officer team. We think we are being quite ambitious with the number of bids that we're currently submitting. Um, we, we, we don't feel that we should go further with regard to other projects. I mean, we're bidding for um, probably coming up to close half of the total fund. Um, so I think that's maybe... Um, I think that's maybe the limit of our ambition in terms of this. If we were to succeed uh, across all of these um, bids, we would be it would be extremely successful. Um, I have broadly answered many of those questions, but maybe Richard needs and wishes to come in on a few of the others. Um, just just really on the the ambition side, you know, we've been in close contact with um, the the local team now from the department for levelling up and and, and um, communities, and uh, there was um, a, a, a slower uptake for round one. We obviously saw the opportunity and we took it. Um, the question was posed: How did we get three applications through and were successful? The answer was: We put three in. So um, for this one, though, the ambition across the region is, and the competition is going to be very, very competitive. Um, there's, they're expecting a, a high number of applications across the region. So in terms of um, um, what uh, uh, John just said, in terms of you know where we're at with that level of funding, having had those conversations, we, we still think we're in in the right place, um, and and yeah. You know, potentially going a bit further. You know, we, we may be putting in time and effort, which may not be rewarded. Sure. There was just one other um, comment there with regard to capacity, and that members does remain an issue. Um, is something that we brought to you in the capital working group um, some time ago, and we've been working on. Um, unfortunately, the labour market is very tight in terms of professionals who can drive forward um, capital projects at this moment in time. We do have um, excellent competency um, within the teams, um, but obviously with the scale of our ambition, um, there is a problem uh, in terms of uh, how we ensure that we have sufficient number of uh, project managers to take forward projects. So that is, um, members, something that we will have to discuss with you further in our next capital working group, which we hope to schedule um, after the AGM, uh, hopefully mid-June mid, mid -June latest. Um, we're, um, we've been also looking at our existing capacity and uh, the projects that we're currently bidding for, and we're satisfied that the projects that we are currently bidding for should be able to be dealt with um, by our existing capacity. Thank you. Thanks, John. I just see Councillor, or sorry, Alban Hussey, uh, the question in the chat box about the, the cooperation with TransLink, and that reminds me about Councillor Doyle on the train. Uh, we'll try Councillor Doyle again. Um, if you're able to join us now, Emmett. Is this any better for you, Chair? Yeah, go ahead, Emmett, now. Thanks very much. Um, two things, and uh, thanks to Alfie and Richard for their, uh, their conversations with me over the week. I'm trying to be crafty with regards to one project in particular about the green infrastructure. Um, there are remedial works that are outstanding in Ballyarnock Country Park, and I'm wondering if they think we may be able to shoehorn those uh, into that bid. And the second aspect of it is, um, from conversations I had with Alfie during the week, um, I understand that we're now in a, a stepping stone process where if we are able to free up capital borrowing power from, strip, uh, from the Strabane Leisure Centre, plus get a good result with regards to uh, the airport that um, you know we might be in a position then to to move to Templemore Sports Complex. I think that's really important. Um, and I just want to seek some sort of assurance that that my thinking is correct on that. Um, and uh, because ultimately we're all getting tortured about, uh, and rightly so, about uh, the progress that we're supposed to be making on that uh, capital project as well. Thank you. Chair, I'll, I'll come in on that. And if Alfie's on the call, he can maybe augment. Um, 
what what I'm about to say. Um, yes, look, um, Councillor Doyle and, and other members, we have presented into um, both the Capital Working Group and the previous Governance and Strategic Planning Committee um, the key funding issues in relation to the strategic projects, as we call them, and the strategic projects relate to um, the main leisure projects and also the city deal projects. Um, and as members know, they, they currently come to a total that is close to £100 million. Um, so we've put forward a strategy to, to uh, look at how they may be funded, and that strategy comprises um, uh, releasing money from uh, the airport um, as and when government uh, commits to it. And delighted to say, obviously, that there's been significant in-year commitment by government in that respect. Um, the rate support grant issue, um, uh, rates investment, and uh, taking a broad overview of that together with the other um, cost pressures that Council is currently uh, uh, dealing with at this moment in time. So yes, any, any additional funding that can be uh, secured toward any one of those strategic projects will obviously uh, enable us to uh, more readily deliver some others of those strategic projects, but we still need to look at it in the round. And again, members, we need to continue this conversation with you uh, to look at the totality of that. But Templemore clearly is a massive strategic priority and is one that we would hope to be in a position uh, to, to move forward once the uh, totality of that funding package can be secured. Uh, I don't know, Chair, if Alfie wants to come in. Pardon? Conscious Alderman Hussey asked about Translink. We haven't been, have we? Uh, no, it's, uh, I personally haven't. Sorry, um, whether um, obviously um, the ENR director have, but I mean, obviously we've been focused on 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 trying to select the projects we have done. Um, uh, I've not been made aware of any um, projects where Transic have been seeking to 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 submit within within the area. So they may well be, but. Um, uh, certainly not in the last conversation I had with um, the DLAC team. There wasn't anything raised. Thanks for that, Richard. I'm sure Alderman Hussey will, will follow that up if needed. Um, Connor, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I was just to ask John in, in relation to the capacity issue. Um, has there been any consideration given to partnering with SIB in any of these projects? And if so, what's, what's been their, their response? So, Again, through you, Chair, we, we've been partnering with SAB for quite some years now, Councillor Heaney, on the delivery of capital projects. Um, we have a number of SAB staff who have been seconded to us to work within the team, and we continue to, to work with SAB to, to see if they can provide some other staff to us. So um, we're, we're exhausting all sources of, of uh, trying to recruit professional staff into those teams at the moment, our own resources. Um, through SAB, through partnering with other agencies. Um, and we're looking at all options, including part-time work, remote working, full-time working. Um, but there is a, a, a great demand uh, for, for um, staff who are skilled in delivering capital projects um, right now. It's fair to say we have a very substantial team, probably um, the biggest team of, of any of the councils outside of Belfast. But of course, we do have a huge capital programme and a huge ambition. Uh, but certainly we're trying to tailor workload um, and demands and balance all of that with funding at the moment. And again, we'll, um, we'll come back to you through the capital working group with regard to what that's beginning to look like. Okay. Um, uh, Derek, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Chair. Very, very quickly. Uh, Chair, would it be possible, I'm not a member of the committee, so I'm just making a suggestion if anybody wants to follow up on it, that, that a letter would go to TransLink and ask them if they're considering uh, application uh, to this round as, as they do fall, um, they're eligible uh, within the criteria uh, and have they any plans for transport improvement via round two of levelling up uh, for our district council area? 
Thank you, Chair. Chair, I, I would gladly propose that. Okay, thanks for that, Morris. Um, I'm happy as chair to second it, just on the basis I think it would be sensible that we would engage with the uh, public sector uh, transport uh, to see what they're planning for the council area. So I uh, don't have an issue with that. I see it's been seconded by Councillor Doyle um, as well in the chat box. Uh, Councillor Doyle is asking, is there any particular points on the Bad Island Country Park that uh, he raised? And, and if officers don't have any now, they can probably go back to him with them. Chair, through you, I don't have anything specific I can update now, but certainly happy to to bring it back to um, the director of ENR and, and provide a response. And, and Chair, just wondering if Alfie wished to further clarify on some of the strategic just, funding yeah, issues. Happy to see Alfie doing one at the stage. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, no, I'm quite happy with everything John has gone through. You know, obviously we have a very extensive capital list and that capital working group is coming up now in, in the coming weeks, so there's plenty of issues to consider. But I suppose the big thing we're trying to do here is use council investment to lever as much external investment as we possibly can. So if these bids are, su are successful, we would see that as freeing up council funds, which we have there. Um, and redirecting those towards other projects and that's been our priority um, over the past few years and it's worked pretty well for us so um, it, it will be a challenge this fund we believe but we believe if very strong bids are put on that um, you know we're certainly optimistic of, of being successful so that's all I wanted to add here thank you yeah thanks for that Alfie um... Folks, I don't see any other speakers on this, and uh, and I do appreciate that we've had quite a lot of contributions on it to date. So uh, it is obviously something that is of huge significance to the the council area, and uh, and as others have said, the fact that we did so well in the in the first round means that there's a huge appetite for uh, an equally uh, positive outcome of round two. So uh, uh, we we'll, we we'll leave it at that for today and, and move on then to item nine, which is the rural capacity support item. Thank you, Chair. Enough. Members, um, you'll see from this report that we're looking for approval for the allocation of the £150,000 non-recurrent budget designated for rural capacity support during the recent rates process. And I suppose I'm just really, really delighted that we're in a position now to um, make these recommendations to you because, as you're all aware, the um, issue of rural capacity support has been ongoing for a number of years. And in fact, um, since the emergence and um, the establishment of the Rural Issues Group. It's an ongoing agenda item. And so today to be able to present to you um, a solution in relation to this, albeit an interim solution, um, is very, very good. Members, um, we know that this requires a policy directive and a funding directive um, in relation to a long-term sustainable approach to rural capacity support. And for that reason, we've been working very, very closely with both the Department for Communities and the um, Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Development. And both of them now have indicated from both a policy context and from a finance context that they're very much proactively looking at how to address this in the long term. Members, you also know from the background information in the committee report um, that Council has been working very closely, not just with the three um, rural local growth partnerships, but all the um, growth partnerships and have been providing dedicated funding towards the implementation of their plans. And, um, this is very much welcome and um, the rural local growth areas would look very enviously at the urban counterparts and with respect to the access of funding that they have from both neighborhood renewal and also village um, the village enhancement program and so members today um, being able to present to you um, recommendations in terms of how best to use that 150,000 pound has come through ongoing engagement with the three chairs the local growth partnerships and they've set out very very clearly as you can see within the key issues that there are particular needs that they have for rural capacity um, one is around operational support and that's really in reflection that there's quite a number of rural groups in existence but they don't actually have paid workers um, and in some cases they don't have the same level of program content as maybe some of the urban groups would have um, the second one is in terms of strategic support so this is where um, the three local growth 
both partnerships have come together. They've identified collaborative projects that work very, very closely in terms of identifying those, but don't actually have the resources towards the implementation of them. And then the final area, which has really come to light as a result of COVID is succession planning. So they've found that there's been a very significant burnout in terms of volunteers. Um, they've recognised that there's a gap in terms of encouraging future leaders to come in to the community and voluntary sector. Um, and they also very much see that there's a need for resilience um, in terms of the working relationship that they have with urban groups. How do they make sure that there's something left behind at the end of it? So the three chairs um, and having looked at these um, key issues have said that they recognise that there's a wonderful of opportunity coming forward where they could get projects to a state of readiness in terms of future funding applications, whether that be through the Rural Development Programme itself, um, levelling up and also in terms of Peace Plus. And for that reason, they've now said that they would like to work together for collaborative projects and they've identified a number of key areas. Um, some of them are around youth and some of them are around health, as well as actually looking within their own geographical communities um, around a number of capital projects. Um, in terms of options of how best to use this £150,000, recognising that this is a one-off intervention in advance of both DERA and DFC coming forward with both their um, strategic policy directive and their funding is that they've identified that um, they could have employed direct staff or they could have used um, the opportunity to procure external assistance and, and looking at that external assistance um, our own officer team within community services have been incredibly helpful in terms of been able to identify terms of reference and support the three chairs in terms of how best that those services would be procured and I suppose that's a really important point for the um, local growth partnerships is that this doesn't add additional burden but actually releases the pressure in terms of being able to take projects to the next stage and so for that reason members um, the recommendation is that the £150,000 which is non-recurrent and has been set aside within council reserves would be used for the procurement of external expertise um, to assist the three local growth partnerships in their collaborative projects and also members um, with respect to um, the Department for Communities and the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Development, that in their consideration of a pilot um, under the current rural support programme, that we would seek that one of those three pilots would be based within our local council area and that we would also encourage both those departments to run an evaluation programme alongside the implementation of the pilot, thereby ensuring that a new substantive programme would actually start in the 23 24 financial year. So very happy, Chair, to take any comments or questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Una. Uh, there's a number of indicated speakers. So uh, Councillor Alderman Devaney, then Councillor McHugh, then Alderman McCready. Go ahead, Mars. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in. And can I just say thank you to Una and her team um, for bringing forward the, this report today uh, and recommendation. And look, Chair, I'll put it on record um, that I have no problem in proposing the recommendation. Uh, I think it's vitally important that, that uh, this money is handed out for um, external expertise. And as Una has just said, in discussion with the local growth partnerships, operational uh, issues are a problem because, you know, a lot of them don't have paid workers uh, and they, they, they do a lot themselves free of service uh, and, you know, and around the, the, the structural support uh, as well. And, you know, uh, and around that, and also see the the succession planning and stuff like that. There, that's vitally important as well because there's one clear message from all the groups that I have spoken to, especially in that rural community um, after the the two years of COVID and the great work that they have all done out there, community groups, local growth partnerships, uh, and all of them. They, there is burnout out there now at the minute. Um, people are tired, and really we need to be planning. For these type of issues uh, in the future and give those groups out there all the support that we can but chair happy to propose the recommendation and once again thank una and her team for the work okay thanks for that marsh uh councillor McHugh, go ahead martin um thanks martin and thanks to una as well for the presentation uh, much in the same vein as uh, alderman devaney uh, I want to welcome the report and again welcome, I suppose, the acknowledgement um, that there is a disparity in terms of the the rural capacity uh, when it comes to these type of uh, 
the, the local community growth partnerships and indeed community groups as well. So I welcome the fact that this money will go some way um, to help address that imbalance. And as the report states, uh, when we see um, what comes out from the two government departments, DERA and the DEFC, hopefully, um, when we get storm out up and running again, we will see um, moves coming from those departments to uh, address uh, this, this disparity um, more fully into the future. And indeed, it's something that I raised directly with the Communities Minister, uh, Minister Hargey, when she attended a, a, a meeting with representatives of the type of groups that we're talking about in this report today. So I look forward to seeing uh, what proposals come out from those departments. And uh, I'm happy to second the uh, recommendation. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, thanks, Rory, for that. Uh, Alderman McCready, Ryan, go Thanks, ahead. Uh, fully welcome the report and the initiative. You know, I know it's only a one-off payment of the 150,000, but it builds resilience and capacity, you know, what you mentioned, which sometimes is overlooked in, in years gone by where, yeah, quick fix is to uh, insert some money and hope, you know, it'll be okay in a year's time. But seeing that the level of detail and the framework associated with this, then it gives me a lot of reassurance that we will build capacity and that resilience within the rural community. Yeah, it's been mentioned about you know rural dis disparity. It may be an inadvertence, but it's it's a reality. Whether it's you know geography, uh, you know access to services, or even just population density. You know where where Morris mentions uh, you know about that succession planning or capacity or burnout. It, those are real issues. There's not many people that can step in because of that population density. Uh, a key point I would like to to look at as this is delivered is in, you know, in a year, in two years' time, whenever that resilience has been built or the capacity is there to be self-sustainable in, in the rural areas, is what else can be done to deliver more sustainable funding or recurring funding, whether that's from the two mentioned departments or even with council, albeit that maybe a rel relatively smaller amount based on the outputs or the the assessment of that pilot scheme and, and thereafter. So not just focus on that kind of year one, year two, but year three, year five and onwards. Uh, thanks very much. Really impressed by that, Una. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, folks, for those comments. I don't see anyone else. Oh, sorry, I do. Um, uh, Alderman Hussey, Derek, go ahead. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, Chair. You know, just to endorse and uh, welcome the, the report. Um, you know, it's an issue, as others have said, that has been rife within our rural partnerships for some time. Great to see that council as such are look seeking to address this and also welcome the pilot scheme and trust that that pilot scheme won't be a drawn out affair. Uh, one of the one of the partner one of the rural uh, EAs is going to have that pilot scheme. Hopefully it will not drag out and drag out and the pilot scheme I know will totally amplify the need in the other two areas and trust that we can get the scheme up and going across all three areas ASAP. Thank you. Okay, members, that's um, been proposed and uh, and seconded, and I, I, I note Councillor McHugh's declaration in the chat box as well. Um, uh, so, members, uh, happy to take that item as agreed. Uh, there's no other indicated speakers in relation to it, and everybody has spoken in favour of it. So, going to treat that as unanimously approved. Uh, members, we're now twenty past six, and we've been going for over two hours. So, in keeping with the protocols we're going to adjourn for a comfort break for 10 minutes uh, and rejoin the chamber here just after about um, 18.35 uh, so at uh, 25 to 7. Thank you folks.
10, which is, hello everyone, we're just going to reconvene the meeting here, item 10, uh, and it is over to Ellen, pages 55 to 146, the draft corporate performance improvement plan 22-23. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. This report uh, seeks, uh, subject to members' comments, uh, to get approval for the release for consultation on the draft improvement objectives and the draft corporate and performance improvement plan set out at Appendix 1. Um, the report sets out also that our obligations in regard to uh, performance improvement arise out of Part 12 of the Local Government Act, um, Northern Ireland 2014, and specifically our requirement to consult with stakeholders on the improvement objectives set out in the plan. Um, as you can see from the report, um, the new uh, objectives are um, three updated improvement objectives and one which is unchanged. And these objectives relate to uh, employment opportunities, healthy lifestyles, greener, cleaner and more attractive district and customer satisfaction. The statutory deadline for return or sorry, for completion and publication of the uh, overall uh, plan is the 30th of June and the recommendation in front of members today is that approval is given to release as soon as possible the draft improvement objectives as set out in the corporate and, perfor and performance improvement plan. Thank you members. Yeah, Alan, thank you for that. Uh, happy to take questions or uh, proposals from the floor or so proposed. Councillor Farrell, happy to propose it. Seconded by Councillor Duffy. Uh, thank you, Alan, for that. Um, item 11 is Rural Needs Annual Monitoring Report. Yes, uh, through you, Chair, again. Uh, this uh, report presents members with details of the Council's Rural Needs Annual Monitoring Report, which is uh, submitted to, to DERA by the 30th of June. Again, the, this particular report uh, relates to our requirements under the Rural Needs Act, uh, Northern Ireland 2016, in which we are obliged to um, compile information on their exercise of our functions, include that information in our annual report and send information to DERA. Uh, consequently, uh, set out at Appendix uh, 1 is the DERA report, which again has a submission deadline of the 30th of June. Uh, the recommendation in front of members today is to submit that report uh, to the uh, DERA uh, as soon as possible. Thank you, members. Thanks again, Alan, for that. Um, again, happy to take uh, comments. Yeah, Councillor McHugh, go ahead, Rory. Or Mugget, Chair. Uh, Chair, just to briefly um, welcome the report, Chair. And on behalf of my own party, uh, we are content with the recommendations uh, from the report. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks for that. Is there a seconder for the report? Thank you, Councillor Farrell. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, okay, uh, next item is item 12, the scheme of allowances. Back to you, Ellen. Yes, uh, Chair. This report advises members of the Consolidated Councillor Allowance Circular LG10-2022, which increases the maximum rates for basic special uh, responsibility allowance and dependent uh, carers allowances uh, for elected members, and also seeks approval for an updated scheme based on the revised circular. Um, I would remind members that at last year's meeting uh, of this particular committee, increases uh, relating to the previous circular were actually rejected uh, by elected members, and the scheme operating at present is based on uh, the 2019 Basic and Special, uh, special Responsibility Allowances. 2020 and stroke 21 rates for carers allowance and the uh, subsistence allowances from 2015 and travel allowances uh, 2017. The recommendation in front of members uh, tonight is that subject to your comments, the updated scheme of allowances set out Appendix 2 is adopted. Thank you, members. Yeah, thank you for that, Alan. Uh, a number of indicated speakers in this item, uh, Councillor Farrell, Councillor Duffy and Councillor Doyle online. Uh, go ahead, Rory. Um, th thanks, Chair, and thanks, Ellen, for the report. Um, the SDLP's position is that we should reject this pay raise. Uh, we rejected last year's pay raise, and our position has not changed since. Families across this city and district are struggling with the cost of living. Uh, we've got council workers who have been recently in stripe. Um, 
arguing for, for better pay and better terms and conditions. And people in general are getting it really, really tight. So we shouldn't accept the pay raise. Uh, we should stand in solidarity with families across the city and district and reject this increase. Um, accepting it would be a slap in the face to families and individuals struggling to make ends meet. Um, so we shouldn't accept the pay raise. Um, so I'm going to make a formal proposal, and that is that we do not adopt the updated scheme of allowances, excluding the dependents cares allowance uplift. So in terms of the basic allowance for councillors, we should not be increasing that, but the increase in place for carers, yeah, we should. So that's a formal proposal. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks for Farrell. Um, I'll need a seconder for that. And do you... I, I second that, Chair John Boyd. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Councillor Duffy, next to speak, and then Councillor Doyle. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in, and I'm of a similar opinion to Councillor Farrell. Um, last year we did reject this, and I am more than happy to reject it on the same basis again this year. I, I do believe that we have been sitting in this chamber or virtually for, for some time now discussing the, the cost of living crisis that has been facing families and workers right across the city and district. And for us to sit and award ourselves a pay rise at this time would be a slap in the face to them. And we, we do need to stand in solidarity. I, I was of the opinion coming in here that we would reject it all, but um, on reflection, I would be I would be happy enough to support the proposal that has been put, put forward by um, Councillor Farrell in terms of cares. Um, I think that that's probably a fair proposal. Um, so, no, Chair, in light of that, we'll support the proposal put forward. Thank you. Thanks for that, Councillor Duffy. Uh, Councillor Doyle, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, absolutely in agreement. Um, I spoke to Ellen about this uh, recently. We are in our cost of living crisis. Um, it would be unthinkable, uh, even though at local government level, we are the only, the only people who are doing any governing at the moment uh, to uh, award ourselves uh, effectively a pay raise. Um, it would be unjustifiable. Uh, and at this point, um, there there is absolutely no justification for um, any of the raises. I do you understand there's um, the, the impact with regards to carers allowance? Um, and uh, I'm happy to go with the proposal, but um, certainly the um, message should go loud and clear from uh, from all of us today that uh, there can be no justification for this and we uh, will reject the scheme. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Emmett. Uh, Aldon McClintock, Hillary. Thanks, Chair. And I don't disagree with the sentiment of what the previous speakers have said, but I do note that I believe everyone that has spoken so far does have other jobs. There are some in council, and this obviously doesn't affect me since I, I won't be um, a failing of any uh, pay next year. But I think it has to be remembered that some of the councillors as well do have a crisis because they have only one job, and this might only be their own source of income. So while absolutely understanding the sentiment and the message that will be sent out from here, um, today, I think it's worth bearing in mind that all those who have spoken do have other jobs and other sources of income, and not all councillors do. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Henry. Um, Alderman McCready. Thanks, Chair. So, first thing is, I'll support the the uh, updated proposal uh, from. I think I was. Who was that? Uh, anyway, so, uh, Councillor Farrell. Farrell. Sorry, my apologies for that. So I do support it. Um, you do bring out a you do bring out a really good point about the cares alliance. So, yes, we are elected, and we speak up for people who are unelected. They put us here, and but when cares alliance, you know, I don't think there should be a difference between a carer who gets cares alliance uh, somewhere else as opposed to somebody who gets cares alliance here, just because they're elected. You know. It's one thing to be uh, in martyrdom, as they say, or uh, go without if others are going without, and I absolutely accept that. Um, but if others are going with within that sector of community of carers alliance, then I don't think councils should be disadvantaged or singled out and treated differently on that. So I'm very, I'm very glad that it's been raised to that point. Um, but equally and secondly, uh, Member McClintic does raise a good point. You know, the alliance, which, and let's be clear for, for members of the public, 
you know, we don't set our own allowances here. It's done by the Department for Communities uh, and the recommendations will come forward. Then we can either accept or reject. Uh, and whilst we, we reject these ones, the allowance is around, I think it's 15,000 uh, with the exception to any other special of responsibilities that you get. So this is your only source of income. That is a stretch, you know, and even over the last six months, I've noticed. So yeah, I'll turn around and not accept or, or I will reject anything proposed here today. But I have to say, folks, it's just because you're elected doesn't mean you're immune to the cost of living crisis. It doesn't mean you're immune to the, the, the charges of oil going up. We all pay the same prices of oil. You know, everyone's got circumstantial differences in their incomes and in whatever stage of life they're at. But to make a carte blanche decision, which affects 40 councillors who may have difficulties themselves, you know, I just think, how long can we sustain this for, Chair? Next year, the year after, at what point has it become uh, unsustainable for councillors to, to be councillors and say, well, I'm really going to have to go get another job and try and pay my bills. Um, I wish I was in a position where I didn't have uh, money issues or uh, or responsibilities to pay bills and children and childcare and, and food bills and, and oil bills. But the reality is I'm the same as anybody else in that street. And it is hard. So I, I would formally reject this offer. But we need to really consider at what point do we lose um, councillors because they can't afford to heat their homes or, or or anything else. So it's they're all valid points which I've heard, Chair. And it's good we're having this debate, and it is right that we take this decision, uh, with the exception of the CARES Alliance, which should be included because it's deserved that those who look after people um, as a carer, uh, there should be no shame in that whatsoever. Thanks, Chair. Hey, members, uh, I don't see any other indicator speakers. Um, I'm conscious that there's been a bit of a debate around the proposal, so I'm not sure if if it's unanimous or if we need to put it to a vote. Um, uh, what I'll do is I'll open it up to the floor and if people, uh, Councillor Farrell has made the proposal, it's been seconded that we uh, that we reject the uh, recommendation to uh, to increase the allowances uh, with the exception of the dependent carers allowance. Um, so that's been seconded. If anyone is opposed to that, then please indicate now either by speaking or putting it in the chat box. So I'm going to take that as passed unanimously um, because no one's come in to speak against that, that proposal. Uh, thanks, members. Um, that concludes that item. Um, the next item is item 13, which is the findings of the Councillor Satisfaction Survey. Again, through you, Chair, um, this report briefs members and seeks endorsement of the findings of the Councillor Satisfaction Survey that was conducted in March 2022 and the subsequent updates and proposed actions, which are set out at Appendix uh, 2. Um, as reported, um, there was a 43% inc uh, 43 return rate in terms of the survey, and indeed happy to report that across the seven areas identified in the survey, there was a positive response with an overall satisfaction rating of 99%. Uh, uh, as also indicated in the report at Appendix 2, there are details of our consideration of the comments that were provided as part of the survey and also our commitment to take forward a number of actions to help improve services further. Uh, the recommendation in front of members is that you note the findings and seek your endorsement of the associated updates and proposed actions. Thank you, members. Yes, yeah, thank you for that. Any comments that people wish to make in this item? Uh, Councillor Doyle, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. It's really just to say um, that the outcome of the, the survey is uh, will be of no surprise. Um, to anybody. We all know that our staff um, right across council do a fantastic job. I'm very grateful for them as I know uh, all members will be and it's just to place that on record um, that you know, we will be lost without them, especially over this last while we've had to do things so quickly and we've had to uh, French on their time a lot more than what we would normally have. Um, so happy to propose the, uh, the edit. Okay, thanks, Sandra. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And just I suppose to echo um, Councillor Doyle there in terms of thanks to Council officers and thank you, Ellen, for presenting the report. I suppose just commenting on um, the number of surveys returned. 
it's a bit disappointing. Um, and I know from my own experience that, you know, he's were trying to get everybody to, to return them because I think I was probably quite late in returning my own. But it's disappointing that um, so few um, took part in the survey and, and returned their thoughts. But in terms of the thoughts that were returned, it isn't surprising that there is satisfaction in terms of the work that is going on and, and how we have been assisted. Um, and I'd, I, I probably just want to comment on the, the hybrid nature of meetings. And I, I am happy to see that returned in terms of what other people's thoughts are on it, because I do think that it is a good opportunity um, for people who maybe can't travel or maybe have other commitments to engage in, in local democracy. And I think that it's 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 a good way of moving forward. Um, we, we talked about um, possibly the, the scheme of allowances putting people off um, becoming a councillor. Um, but certainly sometimes sitting in very long meetings can put people off, particularly women, particularly people with care and responsibilities. Um, but to have that opportunity to come in in a hybrid nature um, is something that may be attractive to people in the future. So I would like to see that explored. I know we, we have that agreed now for, for I think it's to December. Um, so I, I would like to see that explored further um, after that date, um, because I do think it's a good opportunity to get more people um, engaged in de democracy, particularly at a local level. So thank you, Ellen. Yeah, thank you. Um, and can I just also, as Chair, uh, comment on the, the, the good report that's there for uh, for all to see and, and the fact that, um, you know, we as elected members do rely on officers, uh, you know, to, to help us do our job in terms of the committees and, and the work we do in the chamber. Uh, and it has been difficult doing that both in a virtual chamber and in a physical chamber over the past year as we've got back to developing hybrid business. So uh, congratulations to the officers on that. And yes, um, you know, it, it, it is disappointing that uh, that the, the number of counselors who took the time to, to fill in the survey isn't as high as it could be. Um, but I would encourage people that if they do have any points that they wish to raise with officers, uh, then they, they should do that through the through the formal uh, satisfaction surveys when they when they do uh, have the opportunity to do it. Um, but uh, that concludes item thirteen. So moving on to item fourteen, which is um, the update on the EQIA process policy wearing off the poppy and Easter lily in the workplace. Uh, this item, along with. Uh, some other items, the item 15 are open for information, but happy to, to take any comments that people wish to make in relation to those items at this stage. And if not, we'll treat them as for information. Happy enough to, to move on uh, to item uh, 16, which is then in confidential. So if we can have a proposal to go to confidential, please. Councillor Mooney proposed seconder for confidential, please. Sandra. Okay, so thank you, members. We'll move into confidential. I'll just wait for IT to let me know when we stop.